Okay, so welcome everyone to this second part of our symposium on AI in qualitative analysis. Uh, I'm Christina Silva, director of the CACDAS Networking Project, uh, and we're bringing this event to you in partnership with the Social Research Association. My colleague Sarah Bullock from the CACDAS Project is here with me, uh, as are uh, a number of colleagues from the Social Research Association as well, uh, who are working in the background to make everything go nice and smoothly for us today. So this time last week, uh, in part one, we heard from five developers of qualitative software about how and why they are harnessing AI in their tools, and also from three experienced qualitative methodologists, researchers, and teachers of methods and tools about some of the implications of those developments. If you weren't able to join us live for part one, you can head on over to our YouTube playlist and watch the recording, which we fully captioned for access accessibility. Uh, and the link uh, is in the chat for that. Uh, but today we're moving our attention to some practical applications of this topic. First, we have three researcher presentations, each focusing on experiences of using AI for qualitative analysis in a variety of ways. We begin with a presentation about the use of ChatGPT by David Morgan, in which he'll draw some comparisons in terms of process and findings between analyzing the same set of data with and without ChatGPT. We'll then hear about how generative AI is being used for ethnographic projects within a global market research agency. And Heidi Hasbrook and Diana Kotiga will show us how they've been using Ipsos's internal generative AI facility throughout the process of an ethnographic project. Then in our final researcher presentation today, we're moving away from generative AI a little bit to focus on a range of machine learning tools available in established qualitative software programs. And Steve Wright will discuss making informed choices, explaining insights, and reflect also on the importance of transparency. Those presentations have been pre-recorded and after watching each one, we'll have a few moments hopefully for a couple of initial questions from the audience for each speaker. So as they're speaking, please do post your questions in the Q&A space. Then after all three presentations, um, we will move on to the final session of this symposium, which is a panel discussion on the opportunities, challenges, and ethics of AI uh, for qualitative research. That session is chaired by Isabella Piera, who is the head of qualitative methodology at Ipsos, and she will be discussing a number of issues raised throughout both parts of this symposium with respect to the rise of AI for qualitative research in different contexts with our panelists, Prokopis Christou, Donna Phillips, and Sylvie Hobden. We'll introduce you to our panelists and share their details later on. Okay, so for now, without further ado from me, I'd like to get on with today's programme and introduce you to our first researcher presentation. David Morgan is an Emeritus Professor in the De Department of Sociology at Portland State University. He's an interdisciplinary research methodologist, and he's widely known for his work on focus groups, mixed methods research, and qualitative data analysis. He's currently the series editor of the Qualitative Research Method series, which you may know as the Little Blue Books. But today he's here to speak to us about something I know that there's a lot of interest in, analyzing qualitative data using ChatGPT. And David is going to share with us his journey into doing so. Any questions you have, please post those in the Q&A and we will uh, pose those to David later on. So I'm gonna stop my share uh, and then uh, we will be able to see uh, David's presentation. Hello, my name is David Morgan, and welcome to my presentation on analyzing qualitative data using chat, GPT, and a researcher's journey. So like every good journey, this has to begin somewhere. 
and I've listed the various software programs that I have used over the years under early history. And actually, back in the late 80s, I used uh, manual hand uh, counting of codes for a content analytic paper. But in terms of computer assisted materials, I began with the Ethnograph, a program that no longer exists, but was fairly important in the early history of qualitative analysis software. And then moving on, I taught a, for some years, a graduate seminar on qualitative data analysis. And we used Atlas TI because our university had a site license for that. Some years later, I also, to that course, I added a unit on deduce so the students could see, uh, you know, differences between kinds of qualitative analysis software. And then finally, my own personal preference is for Max QDA and uh, various projects I'll show you today. Uh, the original analyses were typically done with Max. Okay, and more recently, these two bullets uh, represent two different parts of today's presentation. The first comes from an article I've just published about using ChatGPT, and I've reanalyzed two sets of previously published focus groups. And the second part of the presentation will be looking at something called query-based analysis that I've been developing. And it's a set of procedures in ChatGPT that can serve as a strategy for qualitative data analysis. So the second one will have a more how-to orientation. But let's look at this first article here. I've called it establishing a proof of concept, and I've talked about it under the goal as experimenting with ChatGPT as a tool for analyzing qualitative data. So literally asking the question with proof of concept, can we really use ChatGPT? What would it look like to make that our main tool for analyzing qualitative data? And in doing that, I've worked with two different uh, data sets that I've used in the past, and I wanted to compare the outcomes from using ChatGPT to the results I got from previously analyzing these two data sets. The first data set has to do with the experiences of first-year graduate students. There are six focus groups total in the data set. And the nature of the research was to talk to these students at the end of their first year of graduate school and to find out you know what that experience was like how they adapted what they learned and in particular from my substantive interest it has to do with socialization to new roles and so we learned quite a bit about those students the second study used 19 focus groups to look at and I'll read this out, dual earner working couples with caregiving responsibilities for both younger children and older parents. So these were sets of spouses that both worked, and along with that, they had children under the 18, age of 18 and parents over the age of 65 where they were providing assistance to those older parents. In the U.S., we sometimes refer to this as the sandwich generation in the sense that they're sandwiched between caregiving for younger children and older parents. In this case, we added more complexity by having both of the spouses working, and that complexity is what led us to do a full set of 19 focus groups. So what was my method for this exploration with chat GPT? Well, I began with less structured queries, and then based on what I got from the results of those initial questions, I followed that up with more specific questions, and I'll show you an illustration of that in just a minute. The overall results were that both cases demonstrated that ChatGPT can indeed be a powerful tool. So I felt like this was a successful proof of concept, if you will. But I felt in what ChatGPT could accomplish, I thought it was more successful at reproducing concrete descriptive themes, less successful at locating subtle interpretive themes. And in particular, I thought that it really requires the analyst to have a strong familiarity with the data. And so 
in looking at the overall analysis process, uh, it isn't like you can just, you know, throw the data at chat GPT and get results back. Instead, you really have to know your data to guide the questioning and answering you're doing with ChatGPT. And so we'll see a little bit of that on the next slide. And overall, my conclusion was that ChatGPT as an analysis tool, it has really the, the potential for disrupting coding as the dominant paradigm for qualitative data analysis. And we'll talk more about this on the last slide. But if you want to look at this particular paper, you can find it in the International Journal of Qualitative Methods, which is an open access journal. So you can go there and download this with no uh, cost and no restriction on your access. So exploring the use of artificial intelligence for qualitative data analysis, the case of ChatGPT. All right. Let's see what this looks like in practice. Here's an example of a broad query from the dual working couples study. And in particular, it just asks, what were the main things that made it easier or harder for these focus group participants? And ChatGPT replies, the focus group participants mentioned that flexibility in work schedule, ability to work outside of the office, support system from colleagues made it easier for them to combine work with family. On the other hand, lack of flexibility in work schedule, difficulty negotiating job shares while pregnant were mentioned as factors that made it harder. No specific information was provided for other factors that made it harder. Well, in looking at this, what am I going to pick up to follow up on? Well, in, in more specifically, I see that it mentions flexibility in both the things that made it easier and an issue in things that made it harder. So I'm going to pick up on that, and then these are illustrations that are drawn directly from the paper, and I'm going to query, what do these participants mean when they talk about flexibility? But I'm not going to read all of this, particularly in the interest of time, but I'll say a little bit. When they talk about flexibility, they're referring to the ability to adjust their work schedule to accommodate family responsibilities. So what I'm going to look at is things in there. I see they're adjusting, they're accommodating, and these are words that I'm going to pick up if I were going to continue the example. I see they're also balancing work and family obligations. Here's another mention of adjusting. They're reducing stress. They're managing work and family responsibilities. If I want to build up a theme here that might be about flexibility, it might be about adjustment, it might be about any of these words, but I'm going to be looking into them and following them up and beginning to think about how all of them fit together together to begin to create some themes, or in this case, maybe one central theme. Um, you know, it, it all depends on what else is in the data. But my overall goal in thinking about this is to imagine the results section of the paper I'm going to write and to think, well, okay, uh, what I probably will say is something like, there were three main themes in the data, or four or five, or there was one overarching theme. And then I'm going to use that as the outline for presenting the results section, theme by theme. And then within each theme, I'm going to have quotations that support and illustrate that theme. So a classic uh, approach to writing up qualitative data. And I'm going to be thinking in those terms throughout. And that'll become more apparent in the next section, which I'm calling Developing a Systematic Set of Procedures. And this is a three-step process that I've labeled Query-Based Analysis, QBA. And step one, we'll use broad, unstructured queries. They generate a set of candidates for themes. Step two, more specific queries refine those themes, suggest relationships among themes. Step three, detailed searches provide supportive data for each theme. Now notice that this is not a bottom-up approach like coding, where you would start with uh, codes that are closer to the data, aggregate them into broader categories, create themes as your ultimate goal. 
instead, this is going to be much more of a top-down approach where we begin with a set of possible themes. But we're going to get those themes not in any de de deductive fashion from prior theory or existing research. Instead, we're going to generate them using ChatGPT's ability to summarize the data as a whole and then pursue that more specifically. Okay, so what we're doing in the three points down below with QBA, we're beginning by generating wide-ranging themes, and then we're progressively developing more detailed versions of those themes, and then ensuring that the final themes are supported by the data. Those are our three steps. All right, so here's the second research project I'm calling it, really the third data set, but uh, I did the other two under very different motivation, that proof of concept. Here I really want to see if I can start from the beginning with these three steps and really do a complete analysis of the data. And the goal in this case is to investigate the effectiveness of ChatGPT for this three-step query-based analysis. And the data in this case was another set of focus groups, six of them, and it was seeking diagnosis for a family member with dementia. So substantively, one of the things about dementia is that the patients themselves are, of course, you know, going to be having difficulty uh, recognizing their own symptoms due to the issues around memory loss. So it's up to the family members to both notice these symptoms and think about what they mean and then decide what they're going to do about them. And in this case, ultimately seek diagnosis. Okay, the results, we produced six basic themes and two broad sub-themes, leading to the conclusion that ChatGPT, combined with query-based analysis, can definitely do high-quality theme-based analysis. So the sort of thing that we're aiming for in writing up our qualitative results, the analysis process, and the outcomes that we're seeking, we've really got a good fit with the set of procedures in this particular research research tool. So let's look at how this works. So first we're looking at querying for the basic research question. And again, this is from the seeking diagnosis data. Here's a question at the beginning. Give me a list of the key themes that affected when and why these caregivers sought diagnosis. Now, in practice, you would probably ask two or three different variations on this to get uh, broad ideas. You can also ask for, say, it says, give me a list of the key themes. Well, that's probably going to be bullet points. You can ask for a longer list. You can ask for give me more detail. So you can do a number of things to get started. And in the work I'm doing, I've listed several different strategies besides just using the basic research question, like uh, using the interview questions as a way to get at these key themes. At any rate, the goal is to develop this list of potential themes. Uh, one of the things you see in the literature, these will be called candidate themes, and then querying to refine them. And the question there to chat GPT is, give me a list that tells me more about the earlier theme of need for a specific diagnosis. Okay, so one of the things that came out of the list in number one was, and it showed up consistently across different variations of that listing, was the caregiver's need for a specific diagnosis. In other words, what's going on here, and in particular, ultimately going to a medical clinic to get this sorted out, that was a tremendously important aspect of the overall experience that they had. And to refine it, I've asked here, uh, again, using the fact that ChatGPT learns more and more about what you're doing by the questions you ask, give me the earlier theme, need for a specific diagnosis, tell me more about that. And so it goes through the data set and finds uh, quite a bit of material related to this more specific issue. Finally, in the third step, we've got querying for specific quotations, and the question is, 
give me direct quotations from the data that are related to the need for a specific diagnosis. So I've settled on that as one of my themes, and I want to now collect quotations from the data that are related to that theme. Okay, the conclusions from this uh, second study are chat GPT and query-based analyses can produce broad comprehensive themes from a very general set of questions. So that's step one. But that requires human judgment. In other words, you have to decide what you want to follow up, what you want to build on, how you want to work with the lists of materials that ChatGPT gives you. Again, as I said earlier, you can't just throw the data at the program. And that goes for the other two points here. It can create more refined specific themes, give you insights into the relationships between those themes. Again, that requires human judgment to decide, you know, what are you going to pursue? How are you going to choose the ultimate uh, names and content that you give to these themes? This prospect of initially developing themes and refining themes, uh, you know, frequently occurs towards the end of a coding process where you've started, you know, uh, by immersing yourself in small markings of the data. But here with ChatGPT, we can get into the core of the data much quicker and we can define it much more effectively. Uh, so I think it's much more efficient. I think it's much more effective. The last point here about searching for and supplying quotations. Again, that requires human judgment to pick the quotations, but that shows you clearly the parallel with uh, traditional qualitative analysis, because you're always going to have to select the, the quotations that go with your themes. And so here, chat GPT gives you a lot of raw material, and you have to be selective about which ones ultimately go into your report. Report. So the bottom line here, which most of you probably already had a chance to read, in AI jargon, there needs to be a human in the loop at all times. So this loop back and forth between the analysis and the conclusions is not automated. It's human driven. And I will say some of the things I've seen about the description of ChatGPT talk about it as an assistant. Boy, I think of it as something more powerful than that, and I haven't really uh, come up with a label yet. I mean, one word would be collaborator, but that sort of anthropomorphizes it as if it's somehow really your team member. And it is a tool, all right, but it's a very powerful tool, and I think much more powerful than the word assistant would uh, convey, at least in my opinion. Okay, what about the broader implications of all this? Well, I would say again that ChatGPT has the power to disrupt traditional methods based on coding. But given how entrenched coding is, replacing it will require a true paradigm shift. And I'm not just talking about colloquial versions of paradigm shift here. Uh, I'm really thinking about the classic work by Thomas Kuhn on structure of scientific revolutions, where he asks in general, how is it that researchers and research procedures get disrupted by new developments? Well, one of the things we would learn from looking at this is that better ideas and procedures don't just speak for themselves. There really has to be a set of advocates. There really has to be some movement somehow that doesn't just say, oh, look, this is more effective. This is more efficient. People really need to be convinced of that because of what I'm calling there how entrenched coding is. Now, Kuhn says the newer researchers are often the first to explore alternative ways of doing things. I think that's interesting in the present context because we've got this whole series uh, put together by Christina Silver and Suzanne Fries, very experienced researchers. As I showed on the first slide, I tend to think of myself as uh, pretty experienced in this area. But I really think that it is going to be important for new researchers to look at this and say, boy, how would I compare this to the traditional way of doing things? Does this have something to offer for me? So that's why I'm saying in this and, this shift will depend on social factors as much as on the potential power of AI. Okay, so again, it isn't just the looking at the tool in some quote objective fashion to see what it can or can't do. 
Instead, researchers really need to choose to use these new options. And as they put out that research, then reviewers and editors will need to be accepting of these particular ways of doing things. And finally, funding bodies are going to have to be open-minded about whether or not to take this on as a legitimate way of doing qualitative research. Well, in terms of my own role or goal in terms of all this, what I hope is that the results of my personal journey with AI will stimulate a larger journey for our field as a whole, and that's going to start with many of you. So I hope I've made a convincing case that we should really be exploring chat GPT as something that really will be the way forward for the next generation of qualitative research. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. David's here. Can you share your... Here yeah, there are. you are. Fabulous. And um, hopefully we'll be spotlighted in a moment so everybody else can see us nice and clearly. Thank you very much for that. Um, there's been lots and lots uh, going on in the chat. I know that you've been uh, answering a couple of the questions along the way, but quite a few of those questions, David, and quite a lot that we hear outside uh, of this symposium as well relate to the concerns about um, the idea of uploading participant data uh, that has been generated for qualitative research purposes into chat GPT. Uh, so I just wondered if we could start there with what your advice is mm -hmm. around that kind of uh, the mo morality, I suppose, of of that um, that side right. of things. And I can't claim to be an expert on that. I will say with all three of the data sets, they were certainly IRB approved for uh, typical purposes, but they're also all of them 10 or more years old. They're thoroughly anonymized. So those are the main things I relied on. But I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding in general here. ChatGPT can indeed use your data for what it calls training purposes. So for the future of the program, it needs to be continually absorbing more and more data. I mean, its basis now is like maybe 10,000 Wikipedias, something like that in terms of what all it's absorbed from the internet. And... I know from our panelists last week that it's certainly possible to obtain agreements where they don't uh, use your data for further training purposes, but I didn't go through any of that. And my analogy is a little graphic here is that ChatGPT digests your data. It's going to absorb it and take it apart and nobody will ever see it again. It's not like you can somehow reconstruct it from what's in chat GPT's training materials. It totally deconstructs everything into less than sentences, into word linkages. And so the idea that someone is somehow going to get a hold of this data based on the fact that chat GPT used it in its training is, uh, I would say, you know, just as far as I can tell, absolutely impossible. Okay. So I guess. Uh, related to that is that each research team or individual researcher would need to look at these kind of ethical issues in the context of the particular study. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. And I think one of the main issues we'll confront is that IRBs and ethics committees just won't be that familiar with this. And so uh, uh, I think it'd be an obligation for people like me to actually learn more about it and to put that into our publication so that subsequent researchers can really learn from early experience. But in my case, I felt confident with the data being so old and so anonymized that uh, I didn't have any problem, particularly given what I know about ChatGPT's uh, use of data for training. It's just not going to be recoverable. Mm. And of course, not all qualitative research uses participant data in that way, does it? I mean, I've done quite a lot of work using, um, you know, publicly available narratives right. or whatever. So I think the issues are different for different sorts of qualitative research. Yeah, and sometimes, certainly. yeah, sometimes we kind of have a sense that all qualitative research is the same. But um, in my experience that, you know, it's very diverse. So I think some of these ethical issues are, uh, are very contextual. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. There's 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 dozens, but I've just one more which came up a couple of times uh, that I noticed was to do with the concept of hallucination uh, and chat yeah. GPT. So there's a couple of questions ar around that. Uh, but did you notice that? Um, and if so, how did you deal uh, no. with it? No, and I've conducted also several of my own just general conversations with chat GPT. Uh, I hate to call them conversations, really. I try to avoid this anthropomorphizing of where you treat it as if it were just like a, a human, but that is the phrase for it, is you carry on a series of questions and responses. And I have only seen it make one, what I would call substantive error, and it wasn't a hallucination by any means. It simply misinterpreted how we would typically use the phrase open coding. Uh, and that was the most I've ever seen. But I, in one of the answers in the Q&A, I certainly emphasized the idea that you need to be familiar with your data. OK, so you can't just uh, take raw data and expect it to give you insights without you knowing whether or not those insights have value. So I think one of the things that's gotten me hooked on this is just that when I ask it broad questions, uh, the answers that come back are just so on target. Uh, you know, they address exactly the same questions and issues that I encountered in my own analysis of the data. And uh, it's, it, I don't know that I want to say it's quite scary. It's maybe a little bit eerie, you know, in terms mm. of, wow, how is it that good? And mm. so that's what's kept me going with it. Uh, you know, but again, that's because I know my data. And in this case, I've done previous analyses, but, you know, almost any analysis uh, process that you look at in qualitative research is going to begin with step one, familiarize yourself with the data. And I think that's really true here. Uh, you have to. So if you've collected your own data, let's say that particularly you've done interviews and you were the interviewer or the moderator in the focus groups, then you're probably pretty familiar with what you've heard. And so that gives you the kind of, I would say that gives you the minimal background you would need to begin analyzing the data. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because some of the thinking I've been doing about this is about how that the kind of questions that you might ask chat GPT um, when doing this kind of work has kind of reminded me of something that I've been saying for years to students when we talk about qualitative analysis more generally about how important it is for example that you're coding to your research question so you're not just coding um, you know um, related to sort of whatever's there but that the coding has some kind of analytic purpose and it seems to me uh, that what you've just been describing is is kind of has parallels to that is that we we don't just sort of delve around blindly in our in our qualitative materials um uh, but we're doing that always with some kind of focus right uh you and in this case i think it's very different from i just want to keep emphasizing the difference from coding because mm. you start there by building these small units from being close to the data and i was impressed with uh some things that were in last week's uh saying that a couple people uh said you know coding is a way to manage data not necessarily a way to analyze it. And if you look at most, again, qualitative analysis processes, you're supposed to learn from that coding and build results from there. And I think here we kind of flip it on its head and say, let's ask some big questions, broad questions, and begin to see what themes we might pursue so mm -hmm. that that top-down approach that I mentioned is, you know, you're learning what you see there. You ask, what's a good question now that I've heard the machines, you know, give me this response? How do I follow that up? How do I delve deeper? How do I begin to develop themes? And I think uh, one thing, I know we're short on time here, but ChatGPT can really do a great job of connecting themes 
And mm -hmm. so often when I see people do so-called thematic analysis, you just come up with a list of three, four or five themes and you don't do the richer process of connecting them up. And mm -hmm. I find that's a real advantage of chat GPT is that you can be on, go beyond just finding individual themes to building something more like a model that interconnects the themes. Mm. So I didn't right. get into okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. We'll come back to you later, David. Hopefully you can um, stay around for a, oh, yeah. a, a bigger discussion with our other researchers. Thank you uh, very much uh, for that for now. Um, I'm going to uh, move on and just share very quickly my screen again uh, so that I can tell you about uh, our next uh, researcher presentation, uh, which uh, is coming from Heidi Hasbrook and uh, Diana Cotiga, who both work at the Ethnography Centre of Excellence at Ipsos. So let me tell you about Heidi, first of all, who's a visual sociologist uh, and Heidi leads the ethnographic uh, research for government, third sector and commercial clients at Ipsos UK uh, by heading up uh, the centre. The topics that she researches includes global health, financial lives and inclusion and diversity. And she's particularly passionate about using ethnography for design and innovation for social good. Diana is a research manager and business anthropologist at the Ethnograph Ethnography Centre of Excellence at Ipsos, where she works alongside Heidi. Uh, and as you'll see in their presentation, Diana has been engaging uh, very much in in-depth way uh, with the use of generative AI uh, for their ethnographic projects recently. And she does so to deliver meaningful insights and human-centred solutions for brands, products and businesses. Unfortunately, Diana can't be with us live today as she's currently on an airplane coming home from some ethnographic field work on the other side of the world. Uh, but Heidi is here, so post your questions in the Q&A whilst the presentation is playing. Uh, and if you want to connect uh, with either of them, then their LinkedIn profile information is being uh, uh, pasted into the chat for you. Um, and I will now stop my share so that we can watch their presentation. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Heidi Hasbrook. I am a director in um, the Ethnography Center of Excellence at Ipsos. Hi everyone, my name is Diana Katiga and I am a research manager at EC and me and Heidi work together very often on some projects. Yeah. Um, so first, uh, we're here to talk to you about um, how Ipsos broadly is using uh, generative AI, but then more specifically how we are within ethnography. Um, and we are going to bring to you a case study to kind of talk through that. But before we do that, Diana, do you want to explain what is Ipsos Facto? Yes. So Ipsos Facto is an internal um, AI program that Ipsos has um, developed with privacy in mind, which means that um, none of the data that's put into it is actually going anywhere else. It's firewalled. Um, and we also make sure that that's um, respected by not putting any um, uh, private um, information um, from our participants just to make sure that um, we're covered in all of the senses. Um, and this helps us um, use AI in an ethical way yeah. while doing market research. Yes. Again, before we go into our case study, some of you might not know what ECE, or ethnography team, does within Ipsos. We do mainly visual methods, sometimes not, but mainly visual methods, uh, where we capture the full contextual lives of our participants. Um, and we're looking at not just what people's values are, or what they say, or their intentions, but we're also observing in real life how that plays out. Um, what are their say-do gaps? What is the context of their lives? how a specific issue or product or uh, regulation or whatever it might be fits into the larger context of people's lives. Our analysis can get big, really big and really unruly because we are filming very long days and we come back with hours upon hours and hours and hours of footage from around the world. Um, and that needs to be sifted through, that needs to be categorized, it needs to be coded, that needs to be analyzed as a data point. And then it also needs to be brought together both in films, but also in reports 
and presentations in kind of more bite-sized and communicable ways. So it means that often our process can feel long and exhausting um, and exciting, but exhausting. And so we were really excited about generative AI because we thought about how we can use it to kind of tackle some of the speed of things, but also stress testing um, all the different ways that generative AI can support us. So should we talk about the case study? Yes. So now we're going to take you through a one of our projects that Heidi and I worked on together recently. Um, and we can take you through each um, different part of the project that we use the ips facto in. Um, so the project we worked on uh, was an um, international multi-market project um, about accessibility and home care. Yes. Um, so we had a lot of participants that we were working with. Um, me and Heidi are both very interested in accessibility, um, in design research, um, how to create better uh, products for everyone. And so we were both very excited about this. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, um, Ipsos Factor came in, so we were also excited to start using this fairly new tool in a project that um, we were thrilled about. Yeah. Um, so the project was for Unilever, and they, it was both for their um, innovation, but also for their communications and considering what's landing so accessible or inclusive, inclusive design of communications and inclusive design of um, actual products. And so it was a big challenge. There was multiple stakeholders on the other side and really passionate ones because people are really passionate about this issue. Um, we had the challenges of, of also doing this in a pretty tight timeline. Um, so thinking about also being able to build our analysis and keep giving insights to our stakeholders as things are happening and emerging in a kind of faster paced way so that they can keep thinking and building their communications and innovations and not just waiting three months down the line until we reveal everything. Mm -hmm. um, so this was some of the challenges we were thinking about. So we've outlined the different phases of the research and how AI stepped in to support us. So starting with project management, then moving into kind of a desk curation phase or kind of um, gaining some background information, uh, then moving into sample and designing a sample, and research materials as well, and then how it then eventually becomes an analysis tool, um, and then finally where um, it, I think you started calling it she, she <laughs> um, turned into a support for the deliverables. Um, so if we're going to walk you through kind of that step-by-step -step process, but we thought it would be fun to show you some of the examples um, in real time of how we use the prompts and how it responded and how Dana really turned it into her friend, colleague <laughs> throughout the process and sometimes told her off and <laughs> uh, corrected her and they worked together and it felt much more uh, interactive in that way. How can we use you in project management? So we would start off with a question like this. We got an answer that I'm not too happy with. I'll ask you to give me a list. Great, so we got some ideas of analyzing project data, analyzing historical data, allocating resources effectively, optimizing project timelines, improv improv improving sorry, efficiency, automating repetitive tasks, and I said, I think that that's quite a good one. Um, we often use it with resource allocation and scheduling, especially because we work in um, international multi-market projects and there's a lot of balls up in the air that we need to be thinking about. Okay, so the first part that we usually use this um, factor is, is kind of to give us a bit of a lay of the land of what's out there, what kind of anthropological concepts might, be, might we be thinking about, um, what can help us um, kind of shake our thinking about this um, theme. So once we um, win a project, um, this project in particular was about accessibility and home care. So I would ask it something like, um, hey, I am an anthropologist. Um, actually, I would say, hey, um, imagine you are an anthropologist working in market research. Excellent. So here it gave us some ideas, cultural perspectives, social dynamics, historical analysis, economic factors. Um, I like these, but I would kind of want a bit of a better um, model that I can be working with. So I can ask it, I say, I like these because I 
said I like field mice. But I like these. Um, can you please give me some anthropological examples um, of accessibility? Excellent. So we came up with the social model of disability, the cultural model of accessibility, the intersectionality framework, the human centered design approach, the biopsychological model of disability. So these are all quite good. So at this point, I would probably, if I was interested in any of these, just kept asking him to give me more information in some of them. But I would say this is kind of already a great um, start for me to start thinking about this research. So usually what happens is I try to stay within the same um, conversation, if possible, um, because I kind of have an idea that it's learning from itself and from the conversation and taking into account all of the information I have given it before. Um, so when it comes to, for example, creating the screener, I wouldn't create a different conversation to this one because I obviously wanted to have in mind when it's giving me a possibility of a sample, I wanted to have in mind all of the stuff that we spoke about before. Um, so for example, now I can um, ask it to help me uh, come up with a complex sample that would cover all of the client needs, right? So I'm gonna say, okay, now please help me create a sample of um, 12 people. So the more you give it, the more it gives you. So it really depends. The quality of your input is going to obviously um, impact the quality of its output. Um, so it's interesting. It gave us John, a 40 year old male with mobility impairment due to a spinal cord injury. He uses a wheelchair and requires accessible ramps and wider doors in his home. Right, so there's kind of a wheelchair user. We have someone with visual impairment who relies on assistive devices. We have someone with a hearing impairment. We have someone with cognitive disabilities. Um, then this is a really interesting one. There is a 35-year-old pregnant woman with temporary mobility limitations. So that would also be quite interesting in the idea that accessibility changes throughout your life and you kind of dip in and out of, of different mobility um, um, being more mobile in different ways. So this is how we can use it to help us build the sample. So after selecting the sample, um, this, is, this is obviously not a, an answer to our questions about the sample, but kind of a starting point and that actually raises more questions that we can share with the client um, and get us both thinking in a very collaborative way about who are the people that they actually need to meet. So it's kind of a starting point rather than a ready-made answer. Um, so once we've sorted the recruitment part out and we have to create research materials, um, what I like to do is I like to brainstorm with it some kind of, basically what kind of questions can we be asking um, in our briefing sheets. Um, so for example, in this case, I would say, okay, thank you for the sample, because I'd like to assist it to give uh, feedback. You're thinking now, please. We create a discussion guide for this project. Want to make sure I am asking the right questions um, while also making observations. Um, can we start off with me giving me a list of topics you think we should? when it comes to accessibility and home care. Certainly, here are some topics you could consider when creating a discussion guide. So daily living activities, I like that. Environmental factors, so understanding how is the physical environment of the home affects the success accessibility, I like that. So that's something that I would be observing. So I like these topics. I like these topics. Can you give me more? Right. We, um, it's always good to not give it a certain number of topics because then apparently I was told you limited. Um, so I always keep it broad. Transportation and mobility, personalized care plans, assistive technology, important system, uh, community engagement, financial support, business design, quality of life. So we like that. So we can then tell, tell um, the instructor, okay, can you now please create um, a discussion guide? having these in mind. 
what happens that at this point is you wouldn't just take this. There is a lot of kind of co collage happening. Um, so there's a lot of copy pasting or taking this and adding stuff, stuff um, asking it to kind of maybe elaborate on some questions or word something differently. So it's kind of like it's it's as if it's your colleague that you're working on this with, so you're not working on it alone. Um, but again, you don't really take anything for granted. You kind of always, I would never copy paste this into <laughs> discussion guide. It's like the client. You need to like think whether this works with your objectives a lot of the times. Sometimes it embellishes the truth, it lies, it <laughs> pretends it's no stuff it doesn't. Um, so yeah, but it's it's a great starting point. And as I said, I always have it open and it's kind of like a con constant conversation that's happening. Should we talk analysis? Yeah, okay. Um, so when it comes to analysis, what we usually do, as you mentioned before, we have a lot of data that we're going to analyze. Um, so it's a fact that doesn't um, we, we still do all of that analysis itself. Uh, what happens is that it, help us, it helps us after our analysis is finished. Um, for example, I would give it my notes and I would be making models, engaging with the data, um, and I would ask it to maybe give me different topics or tell me there's some um, missing information from my data. For example, there are some other models out there that are confusing what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think I noticed. Like something that I really appreciated with this project and the way that you were working with it. Also, was so we work with ethnographers around the world. They, English is really a language, one of the reasons that we work with them is that they speak a native language, and so the place they're going. Um, English is your native language, sir. Um, and so often we're getting notes from the field, and we want them fast, we want them fast, so we can start thinking while we were still in the field. Um, and they're never client facing, you know, they are. Um, they're, they're people's minds, they're thinking through, there's the details in there, and it's amazing. But previously, it would take us quite a long time to turn that into, for example, a, a bio card of a participant. This allows us to take that data and input it into Ipsos Facto, removing bad names, and, you know, those kind of specific things, and getting them to write, um, rethink it, reformat it into something a bit more consolidated, a bit more clear and concise, or even just checking, I've written this, is there any gaps? Uh, can you be my copywriter? These kind of things. And I have seen a completely a faster move of that, and then also reducing that kind of burden of being a copywriter um, when I'm kind of quality assuring. And also just making sure that the language is, is uh, when you have so many people working on a project, making sure that there's a similar language throughout as well, so there's a similar voice throughout. Now, this is to say, like we've said the whole time, we don't just copy that and paste it in. It's a, it's a sense checker. So often it's sense checking our work, we're consolidating, or sometimes you need to do the different formats. You need the 50 word, you need the 100 word, you need the 500 word. And getting that faster cut for notes from the field or giving our, being able to give our, our clients something while things are happening in the field without it turning into a massive burden. Yeah. That definitely is that when it comes to my to a senior article, um, I feel because I, I've always struggled with assembly. <laughs> um, so it really helps me that it helps me kind of like streamline stuff, or say it in a more simple way, in a more eloquent way. You know, because a lot of times, kind of when you think about analysis, you kind of just jot it down everything. Your brain is working really, really fast, um, and then that's great. But then when you're actually writing it, then it's kind of it's kind of double the work, right? Yeah. Because now I have to make it into something that clients can. And especially when you're speaking about anthropology, you have to make sure that you're not using anthropological or um, academic terms that are quite insular in their meanings. Um, so that is definitely going to help. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great example because I think um, you can get in your own bubbles and you can make, you can make um, the AI be, like you did, in, which you showed in the example, you, know, you can make it be, be an anthropologist right now, or be somebody that knows nothing about it. Be a marketing person right now, or be a designer right now. You can get them to be the other voice, to be the sense check. Does this make sense to you? Are there words that you wouldn't know? All of this kind of stuff, and it feels silly, uh, but giving them a different, giving it a different hat actually makes it think in a different way, uh, or generate things in a different way. Uh, so yeah, I think as a person that was o uh, overseeing the project, I definitely saw an elevated quality. And a speed uh, with the speed, uh, which is nice because often quality and speed can go together, and that's one of the biggest frustrations for the research. I'm looking forward to being able to analyze actual video footage. Yeah. Or, you know, so we're not relying as much on the say, but also the observations, which is also, I guess, why.
one feel those things so important. Because we're, we're also, now that we have this generative AI, we're getting our ethnographers in the field, whoever the field is looking at this too, to, uh, to write more descriptively, write the thick description, the anthropological thick description of what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what they're sensing in the space, not just what people are saying. Mm -hmm. Because all of that description that we can utilize within generative AI to have that kind of analysis early and not relying on a transcript of an interview um, that you might want to input there and say, fine, do that. Instead, you're actually also getting the descriptive element of what uh, the context um, and the experience that all our people in the field are having. So, um, do you want to start? Yeah, so we've seen, um, we, you were able to basically see how we do it um, day to day. Um, I pretty much have Ipsos Factor open all of the time and I chat to it um, constantly. However, we were also aware there are some limitations uh, or kind of doubts around AI. Yeah, so um, I think a couple things to flag when you, when you just kind of saw those examples is there's a lot of concern around the ethics of how bias it is because obviously the, it's it's learning from us and the reality is is we as society are biased and we have a lot of biases that get put and who are the voices that input for it to learn from so we know that there's all these kind of limitations and ethical considerations which is why we shouldn't look at it as the answer tool but rather as a conversation it's another voice in the room and i hope we showed you how that's another voice that we didn't take it as the voice um, and a complete shortcut, but actually as an option, an opportunity to enhance and think and challenge ourselves. Um, but also, um, I think the shortcuts is more also sense checking or getting another voice in that room. Um, yeah, so as things develop, we have to be mindful of um, some of the more ethical challenges of what that voice sounds like and not giving it too much power. Yeah, and um, Ipsos definitely has that in mind. So there are developers that keep developing this tool. It's definitely not perfect. Yeah. Um, it might never be perfect, but as Heidi said, it's kind of a conversation that's happening. There is a lot of um, working groups um, throughout the business, um, and I'm part of one of those who are kind of using it um, a lot all the time, noticing what stuff needs to be improved, uh, what stuff's missing, what's doing well, um, and kind of sharing the excitement with our colleagues. Yeah. And so what we showed you today, I guess you could say, is almost the beta version, the baby, yeah. that's going to keep growing over the next couple of years. Um, yeah, and hopefully this is a useful conversation starter and gets you to think about how you might find it valuable um, and where you can use it, not just in terms of analysis, but all of it, all of that process of research. Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Thanks. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. Okay, thank you very much. Ah, oh, Heidi, there you are. Welcome. Um, lovely. Hi, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for, for your presentation and for being here. We've just got a couple of minutes um, for a couple of questions. Um, uh, I was going to ask you the question about confirmation bias but I think you uh, spoke to that right at the end uh, with Diana so I won't go back to that right now uh, so I was I wanted to ask you something about your clients perceptions about this so not so much about the ethical issues because I know you handle that by having your in-house um, uh, AI that's firewalled uh, and so on so some of the issues we were talking about uploading to chat GPT with yeah. David earlier are, are different in for you but so I was thinking more generally about how uh, the clients uh, for whom you do your ethnographic studies what do they generally feel about your use of AI? Um, actually pretty positive I think um, actually even organizing for this when we spoke to our client about it um, there was two of them and one of them hadn't even realized we'd been using it. And the other one was like, yeah, of course they've been using it. Um, and then they were like, well, can you share with us? Because it's kind of exciting. So I think everybody's seeing it as an exciting space. I think it's once you get past the kind of ethical concerns of where's the data going, is it going to be, you know, this kind of, um, because they're, you know, buying private research, they, they just want to make sure that there's that element of it. But then I think, um, Beyond that, I think it's allowed for a conversation of being able to give uh, more time to the kind of human element of our 
research and less getting bogged down by some of the things that have often short, made timelines stretch that are less about deeper insights and more about kind of logistics and getting through things or sifting. It, it's allowing us to have more time on the deeper thinking. Um, and, and I think in that way, they appreciate it. Um, so I don't, we're not trying to use it to kind of speed up projects that are already feel too fast, but rather just get better projects. Um, and I think they appreciate that. Um, you know, and for us, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, and so do you, do you think that's observable in your outputs already then? Yeah, I definitely, quality? yeah, I think the quality and I, I mean, I think, I think the quality at that speed. So I think it's kind of the, um, you're reducing those kind of, we mentioned things like copywriting, you know, and a lot of people, English isn't their first language. Um, and I mean, Dan is not here right now. She's literally on a flight back from Vietnam for field work mm -hmm. right now. Um, but I think one of her hurdles has been English is her fifth or sixth language. And so, you know, having to create very fast, you know, creating an entire report in a week uh, mm -hmm. when English isn't your first language and then being able to actually um, check, send check it, but then also being able to provide different formats for clients in a quite quick way. So giving the longer report but also giving kind of short write-ups and things like that so that it becomes useful for different audiences. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. So for dissemination, it's really helped. Um, and then, yeah, I think for setup as well of a project. So we're methods-based, we're not a sector. And so us being able to get up to date on um, a new kind of brief, you know, my briefs range from international development and global health to government research to, FMCG to automotive to whatever, you know, so all of a sudden I have to become a car expert, but then the mm -hmm. next day I'm an expert on tax. Um, so being able to, um, being able to kind of get up to speed and, and not necessarily know everything and use it as an encyclopedia, but know the frameworks mm -hmm. to the way people think within those sectors or within those spaces. Mm -hmm. So you saw at the beginning, we even just thought, you know, we're doing this project and asking what frameworks would be relevant to just help us start thinking from the very beginning and getting us like, okay, yeah, I remember these from my undergrad days or my master's or my, you know, you can, okay, yeah, that would be actually quite useful. And so then you can get deeper quicker and start building in. Um, and actually, it was really, yeah, it was great because we used some of the frameworks. So we used mm -hmm. uh, frameworks around, um, uh, you know, around this, this different disability frameworks that we actually use in the workshop with the client. So we were able to bring them on board with things that were more theoretical, but also really important in terms of kind of activist um, disability research and things like this. So um, yeah, I think it kind of gave that extra level of depth. Yeah. So you say depth, but also breadth, like yeah. as well, isn't it? Because if you're asking you know so the fact that you're using it throughout the process and asking about potential frameworks and um and, and having maybe some you know we talk about confirmation bias and things about you know uh things we what we ask for um uh and being being told what we already know but it seems to me that some of what you're doing is broadening that out and saying well what else is out there that we might not otherwise have been thinking about exactly is that fair to say absolutely yeah i mean it's um, it's the way we frame it as another mind in the room um, so that you're not alone in your thinking and you're getting pushed a little bit more and kind of going, well, what would other arguments be? Or what would another way of looking at this be? I mean, I actually was just on field work um, this past week in Kazakhstan for a different project. And I had about 8,000 words of field notes, which was just me, you know, in the evenings, writing down all the things I kind of observed and heard and everything. And then being able to put it into the generative AI and say, what are the themes emerging out of here? And it might be a confirmation of what I'm already noting, but just getting it to be reorganized in a different way and then going, oh, okay, yeah, that is there. Um, mm -hmm. But then digging deeper and seeing if there's anything else they might've noticed, which it did. And I was like, oh, I hadn't actually thought about that one. There was some confirmation, but there was also some kind of pushing me to think, is that a theme? Um, but there is limitations with that because it's generative. So it does try to find like, um, it tries to deduce, right? So it tries to find, okay, there are these themes and it kind of creates everything equal. 
Whereas mm -hmm. actually in reality, especially with qualitative and ethnographic research, it's about finding sometimes that nuance, odd detail and pulling and, and, and pulling that out and making something more from it or thinking harder on that one thing. And mm -hmm. generative AI is not going to do that. It's just going to kind of thematically say, here's eight ideas. Um, so it's still up to you as the human to kind of go, you know what, there's something really interesting about that one little object or that one little moment or that one little sentence that we need to be thinking more about. So, you know, it's still, again, a yeah. conversation. Yeah, so not a replacement. I think we'll come back to these issues again later. So we're going to have a longer uh, chat after our uh, next presentation. Thanks so much for now, uh, Heidi. Uh, really appreciate uh, that uh, and lots more to discuss later. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to share my screen again so that I can introduce everybody uh, to our last um, researcher presentation for today, uh, which is uh, coming from uh, Dr. Stephen Wright, who's an independent CACDAS consultant and a certified trainer of several qualitative software programs, Atlas TI, MaxQDA, NVivo, and Quercos, as well as very experienced user of other analysis packages. Steve's recently um, had a series of teaching data sets published by Sage Research Methods, uh, developing guidance and approaches to working with new technological innovations, including some of the ones we're talking about uh, at this symposium. His aim with those is to enable step changes in the scale and scope of qualitative research projects through integrating AI powered auto transcription and text mining. Steve's interest in methods development and digital tools developed through his PhD in technology, technology enhanced learning uh, back in 2014. Uh, after 18 years working as a learning technologist at Lancaster University, where amongst other things, he delivered qualitative software workshops, he's going to be starting a new post at, as a senior lecturer in medical education at the University of Central Lancashire, Lancashire from February 2024. So really looking forward to this. It's going to change our focus a little bit. Uh, away from the generative AI onto the machine learning. So we'll now uh, hear Steve in his pre-recorded presentation. Hi, my name's uh, Steve Wright. I'm presenting about transparency and making decisions, choices, and explaining what you can find uh, when you're using machine learning uh, and some of the new AI tools with QDA software. So um, I'm an independent QDA consultant. I also work at Lancaster University. I'm just about to start a new role at UCLan as a senior lecturer. Um, and I run training across a range of software and have been working on sort of developing methods, developing teaching data sets. Um, tried to generate an AI image to launch this. So I asked uh, Bing to generate an image of a sentient AI robot explaining the Gartner hype cycle to a room full of human students. I kind of felt like a way of bringing this together. Um, one of the other bits here is that there's a lot of hype around here. So what am I talking about in this? Well, this is what my kids were called the olden days, also known as uh, around late 2017, mid 2017 until the beginning of this year, um, when machine learning was being integrated into QDA software. So I'll be talking briefly about hype versus reality, thinking about qualitative data, giving some examples of some machine learning projects uh, that I have worked on, comparative analysis, comparing software, uh, creating comparative resources between different packages and some contemporary tales of things that are happening right now in the training and support I offer. Um, I want to sort of explore what can the AI approaches learn from some of those previous machine learning approaches and conclude with thinking about what next, some wish lists. So if we're talking about the olden days um, up until this year, I, I feel like at the moment we're we're at this point of AI, the peak of inflated expectations. I do wonder if this uh, se seminar series will lead to that rapid skating down um, 
beyond the inflated expectations. But I also think that we could learn a lot from the earlier incarnation of automated coding. Um, I mean, AI is huge hype. I think humor, humor just really helps punch through this. I love this description of ChatGPT as mansplaining as a service, uh, a service that instantly generates vaguely plausible sounding yet totally fabricated and baseless lectures in an instant with unflagging confidence in its own correctness on any topic without concern regard or even awareness of the level of expertise of its audience. It would be really problematic, I think, if we replaced uh, an insightful, thoughtful approach to exploring content and meaning with mansplaining coding. So what is being promised? Well, we're seeing a similar pattern of promise with AI as we saw with machine learning. So goodbye to tedious analysis tasks, get results in a fraction of time, gone are the days of countless hours spent manually coding. So Atlas DI currently uh, advertises the AI coding. Back in December 2021, so two years ago, this is a great new feature if you need to gain insights quickly. So the same way it is being promoted. So AI assists simplifying and bringing the power of open AI. But what isn't really being talked about is scale. And I think this quote still has a lot to be said for it. The qualitative analysts have mostly reacted to the newfound wealth of online data by ignoring it. They've used their new computerized analysis possibilities to do the more detailed analysis of the same small amounts of data. And these promises are about doing that, but quicker. So qualitative analysis has not really come to terms with the fact that enormous amounts of qualitative data are available and analysis techniques have not really been developed that would allow researchers to take advantage of that. So that's kind of the challenge. Um, and we're talking about speed is being emphasized, not scale. So what are we talking about with qualitative data? Well, qualitative data Another way of thinking of it is unstructured, and the majority of coding is around human reading, interpreting, and labeling to impose, stru impose structure onto unstructured data. Again, I'm putting a lot of XKCD cartoons in here. I love this idea that if you wanted to present this, you could say that you trained a neural net to sort the unlabeled text into your own categories because. If you actually sit and do it yourself, you are training a neural net. Um, so, but unstructured text is a document with no computer markup. So rather than thinking of it as qualitative data versus quantitative numbers, this is unstructured text. So it's unstructured that it can't be analyzed through quantitative methods, but it isn't a free form jumble. Human language is governed by complex sets of structural rules, and those are the kind of patterns that computers thrive on. So you can develop machine classifiers to classify text, which is text mining. So text mining is the use of computer techniques to exploit these syntactic and semantic rules um, and allow them to then classify text bring it together and label it. So for example, labeling parts of speech, labeling nouns, looking for clusters of phrases around nouns, and then suggesting that these noun phrases look like, well, you could choose what you call them, are they themes, problematic terminology potentially, concepts, essentially that's what you're looking at, is classifying types of language. It does feel a bit, again, like XKCD nails it. This is your machine learning system. Yup, you pour the data in, this big pile of linear algebra collects the answers on the other side. And if the answers are wrong, I just, just stir it until they look right. <laughs> it's a bit of a black box. So I started experimenting with this when, the, um, when this was brought into NVivo. And we had a challenge at the university. We have a lot of, we have the National Student Survey. It has a significant effect on the, uh, on the rankings. Um, lots of analysis of the quantitative data, but generally the comments were being, well, one person kind of got to read all of them. Otherwise, they were broken down, shared at faculty or department level. But a lot of the prejudices about qualitative analysis comes in. There's no structure to the analysis. You just start reading, you have confirmation bias, you pick the things that you're like, yeah, yeah, I've always thought that. It's not systematic. So we had 
nearly 1,900 respondents. We had nearly 4,200 comments. They could be identified by department of faculty, but you couldn't associate them with the comp stores. So there was a limit to the mixed methods approaches. So the key questions were, could we do it? Could we meaningfully categorize and organize this comment data? That's the methods question. If so, what themes and factors were related to teaching, learning and assessment, where there was some obviously some negative quantitative results. What about negative sentiment, negative comments? But also, is there anything good in there we could pull out? And then could this be applied to other larger data sets, for example, significantly larger, 200,000 odd lines of module feedback? So I drew on the established decision questions for QDA software use from the Cactus Networking Project, who organized this event. So what kinds of amounts of data do you have was quite really important. The methodologies was being defined and it wasn't the really theoretical. It was very much just what can we do? We were interested in the terminology used. We were interested in sentiment. Um, big issues were how much time was there, how much analysis time. I would be working individually, but it would be working alongside with the data analysis unit and with a view to are we just training one person to just do this once or could this be made sustainable and what packages and costs would be associated so we had a couple of options lexamancer was site licensed so i looked at lexamancer qda minor was not site licensed but seemed to be particularly promising for this um in vivo plus had just come out which brought in this kind of text mining approaches where it would be able to cluster noun phrases together and do sentiment analysis and then group those under what it called automated themes i also looked at atlas ti which then was at version 7. so atlas ti was objective because it had no auto coding features it just had word frequencies and text search i should emphasize that since more recent versions it would now be considered and quite probably selected um scaling is still a bit of an issue it, it while it was happy to work with the nss data and the new versions of have a quite extensive uh auto coding it, it doesn't scale to the 200,000 line um data in vivo 12 was selected it worked well with the nss data but it still could become slow and it was very processor and memory intensive and subsequent versions release one and version 14 have been noticeably slower with this data set so i'm not actually demonstrating it live um it was impossible to scale beyond that data set to the much larger set of comment data but there was advantages for both atlas and viva there was a local user base local training and institutional wide licensing QDA minor was considered, it was incredibly quick and it really scaled well. However, there were some complexities and there was no local peer base or user support. There was some cost, cost associated with it as software. Um, it had some great visualizations, so it was somewhat complex, great for furthering analysis, less great for presenting it to a non-specialist audience. And there were some, a lot of my going back over this, I've seen a lot of emails to and from they're very responsive and helpful support but having to call on a lot of support can be challenging it slows things down lexamancer was considered it was very quick it was scalable we had a license but there was no real local user base and ultimately the thing that that led to not going with it was that the visualizations were great for exploring the data but actually what it was able to output direct from the program was much more oriented towards furthering analysis rather than dissemination so then you'd have to take that data and do a lot more post-processing of that and again that's time now the outcomes of this this is just a caution to everyone be really realistic it got pretty much a massive shrug that's partly timing i was asked to present this just when they got the tef gold and it was me followed by the celebratory champagne so i got all the attention you get if you are the person between uh, a group of people a load of work and their celebration of champagne but just remember these questions that drive research not 
methods. So developing these methods is great, but people are only going to be interested if they can use them to answer a question. This did lead on to some subsequent work like that, where there was a question. A local district council had um, undertaken a huge public consultation, had 25,000 comments. They were doing some great statistical analysis, but again, similar, didn't know what to do with the comments. A academic from Lancaster had challenged them on this and they had thrown the gauntlet down and said, OK, will you help us then? What can we do? They had heard about my NSS, they'd seen the stuff for that, came to me and said, can you help? So because we had the local training, they were able to come to the training sessions which I was running, gain familiarity with NVivo. And then I was working intensively with a group of three people, experienced data analysts, not with qualitative, to get them working with the auto coding in NVivo. So basically running these um, noun phrase classifiers to bring things together, running sentiment analysis and doing cross tabulations. The projects became very unwieldy. We had to start merging data just to make it workable. Um, and we were frequently hitting slowdowns and, 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 and crashes because of the scale of the data. Um, so most recently, I worked on developing some teaching data sets in order to try and upskill people and give them you know, some example data that was at some scale. Uh, a lot of example data is very small or is very survey driven. Um, the Trump White House press conferences were publicly available, labelled with speakers. Uh, there are 105 press briefings. There, some of them are two hours of transcribed audio. Um, so it's felt, and they were famous. And as we all remember, they were crazy. <laughs> they really were some incredibly memorable bits involving, say, bleach and sunlight, for example. So they're well known, they're public, and they were fascinating for so many aspects to explore in terms of discourse, in terms of language, and so on. But because of the scale of it, you kind of had to start with some text mining in order to find relevant bits if you wanted to do subsequent qualitative analysis. So this is about qualitative content analysis, Developed these for SAGE research methods, written up as data sets, and they were published uh, last year. Um, actually, very beginning of this year. So I did this on Atlas TI on Mac and Windows, and NVivo then released one on Windows. So I was able to automatically code in Atlas TI for the speakers because they were all labeled with a colon at the end of the name. I had to generate the list of all the speakers from Atlas TI in order to create a list that I could use in NVivo, because in NVivo to code the speakers, you have to know all of the speakers. So if you were, say, coding a parliamentary debate, you'd have to know everybody who spoke in advance. With Atlas TI, it will automatically look for the pattern. There were then different coding options. So the process in NVivo was as I showed you earlier, whereby you can cluster noun phrases. It's called autocoding for themes. It basically takes the name of the core noun and shows you explicitly all the subcodes. If I skip back to the previous slide here, you can see here I've organized academic staff. Under it is lecturers. Um, and then under that is a whole series of phrases that include the word lecture, lecturers, lectures, etc. And those are clustered together under this heading. And then you can arrange those under meaningful categories yourselves. Um, so that is how Enviva does this. Um, it also does sentiment analysis where it will give you moderately or very positive, moderately or very negative. It is not entirely explicit how the decision of moderate or very is given. You can also choose to autocode based on existing coding patterns. This is an amazing potential in that you are talking about coding some sections of data and then using that as a pattern to on code onward. In practice, um, it has proved somewhat more challenging to use. Um, 
And when I've worked with people on specific fixed data sets, we've coded a set and then said, please apply this to the further document. It hasn't managed to match it. So it applies all the codes. So you hit this button, it applies all of those codes, it codes your data, and then you can review, reorganize, split, or arrange those. But the codes are directly applied onto your data. It makes the database much significantly bigger. It makes working with the data significantly slower. And then you sort out what it has done afterwards. Atlas TI, as I've said, it can code based on the pattern of the speakers. It will also has three auto coding options. One is concepts, which is similar to the themes, base forms as distinct from stemmers. It clusters noun phrases and it shows those. So let's go and have a look at how that appears. Here are concepts. So we can see if I look at coronavirus, then at the bottom are all of the clustered noun phrases um coronavirus death coronavirus recommendations resources more than 20 so it's clustering these things together healthcare likewise our frontline healthcare providers so this is quite similar that's the concept coding um sentiment analysis is then into positive negative or neutral um and they are explicit about the models that are used um they will open source data sets. Envivo is using a commercial product called Lexalytics, and it is not uh, open source or published as to where and how the classification is done. Um, and finally, there's name density recognition. Now, this is particularly useful in this data set. It will look for them a bit like the concepts, but it classifies them based on lookups of whether they are an organization, a place, a person or miscellaneous. So again, here we can see you've got named entities um, for different locations. And I was then able to organize those myself into um, overseas cities, US cities, US states and territories or countries and make decisions on the classifications. And classification is never neutral. So, for example, where is Russia? Is Russia Asia or Europe? Um, it's interesting to know how Africa, only a handful of African countries, only Morocco and Nigeria were mentioned. Everything else was just Africa, whereas people didn't tend to talk about other continents in that way. Um, now, the other key difference is that Atlas CI proposes the codes which you can review and select and then you choose to apply them so you can intervene and choose or if you want to speed it up you can just say apply the lot so you can then explore cross tabulations so we can then start to say show me where dr burks mentioned testing show me where the president mentioned testing show me where they mentioned ventilators or china you can also combine sentiment to say right show me where talking about China was classified as negative, neutral or um, positive, and then combine those codes together as saved queries to look at, say, show me where President Trump was negative about China. So that's what you can do. And then you can go and look at that data in more detail and do further analysis. Um, finally, some cautionary tales. So auto coding um, on one of the modules that I've supported, they will actually not be using NVivo uh, or Atlas TI for the novice people who are first encountering QDA, because what happened last time was several people just press auto code for themes uh, and then went, oh, I've done the themes. And AI coding looks a bit like it might be doubling down on this, but with a kind of mansplaining element. By contrast, I'm also seeing people using the AI coding. Somebody is quite overwhelmed, their RA colleague has gone off, and they've suddenly got double the workload, and their initial coding is very content driven. When I've shown them the AI coding, they've been like, wow, that's picking up loads of stuff we were having to add. But the challenge is it's not mapping to their existing coding frame, so they're still going to have to do quite a lot of work. And likewise, I'm working with a PhD student who is um, doing things about working with AI. So for him, using the AI coding is becoming almost an imperative. It's like, well, do you want to not use it? 
when you've got this opportunity that you could reflexively bring that into your consideration about how does AI code people talking about working with AI? Um, so these are conditional things from all of this about tool choices. So who are the audiences? How much do they want to know what's under the bonnet? It's quite different if you're a PhD in linguistics who really has to justify the language models that are used compared with if you just want to see, well, we want to see something better than just a word cloud of frequencies. Who's involved now and in the future? How, what are your training overheads? Is there existing familiar? Is there a pipeline of people who can do this or are you creating one person somewhere in the organisation who can do this for only them and then you would lose the institutional memory? And what what are the priorities? There's always a trade-off between the time and scale and the fidelity and depth. If you want to apply all of the codes immediately, you don't get to review them. So how much intervention or management do you want? What about change over time? It would be really interesting to see if NSS comments or customer feedback or um, you know, army contact reports are changing over time as technologies, as other changes happen. And what's the cost? Software time training, but this dispersal of this is a silo of skills and knowledge. Um, what I'm seeing again is a lot of things talking about speed, not scalability. To me, scalability with AI is the key thing. The moment, if you try and multi-select large numbers of documents and say AI code, tends to grind to a halt. Processing speed is still a real issue, and the supervision organization combination of how things proceed are key. So you have different levels of when and how you can do this with the machine learning and the text mining. So what's missing? So this is my view from right now for me, but that's what, two weeks ago for you, that the leading packages at the CI and Vivo QDA Miner are based on an old software paradigm. They are installed software, so they don't effectively scale because they are constrained by your local machine, the memory, the processor speed. I know this is changing and this is probably the biggest thing, but we need to move towards much more scalable platforms to work at this scale. And the integration of AI tools isn't consistent with the approaches of the text mining. So in Atlas TI, you can choose which codes you have a lot of intervention and oversight of the concept mapping but the ai coding you can only choose how many top level topics and it just applies it ai summaries aren't supervised and pattern coding iterative ai isn't really supported so what's missing or where next well again i think scalability that is the real promise of this ai integration a more iterative engagement one of the great things with these machine the text mining approaches was that you could go and go, yeah, actually, I like that, but I need to reorganize. I need to differentiate work between building work, voluntary work, and coursework. And I'll put coursework under teaching and assessment. But that, in, that takes time. Um, what would be great, I think, would be things like when you are pattern code, the pattern coding, bringing AI into that. So you would code the first two uh, systematic review papers against your protocol and then say, please code against this protocol. I've seen other approaches like this where that would be the key. I will manually do the first view and then supervise the AI and so on. That is the model of things like Discover Text, uh, which has phenomenal potential in this. Um, the challenge I've always found is that the examples have always been drawn from Twitter data and again, time to learn. Um, showing the working. So what are the definitions? What data was used to generate these codes? What language was used? That would be very useful. I really am concerned about a move towards sort of mansplaining themes. What about being able to ask AI to code to say, I want you to label the key content, extract the key concepts, label the language, label the structure. So could we say, can you please code all the metaphors under metaphors? I'll then review them or spatial metaphors. And the other thing is time sequence explorations. How does data change over time? 
how do we speed up, scale it up, but allow you to see the same coding frame that can be expanded a bit, but how does that coding frame, how does that coding change over time? That would be a real opportunity to label and then review. So thank you. I hope you found this interesting and I welcome your questions. Okay, thanks to Steve there. Maybe we can get you to put your video on very quickly and have you spotlighted. Uh, we are really tight up our schedule, Steve, so I'm going to ask you one question and I'm going to see whether you can answer it with one word answer. OK, I want a yes or a no. And then when we get back from our break, I'll come to you um, for uh, another few questions before we open up to the others. So you spoke a lot about scale. OK, so my question is, do you think that the more recent developments in generative AI perhaps used together with some of the olden days machine learning techniques that you discussed will actually lead to more researchers working with qualitative data at scale? Yes. You do? <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, I hope so. I, I think hope so. Me, that, that is the real possibility here. If, if we can br bring some of the best bits of the machine learning where you've got this supervision, bring that into the AI, I think that combination there could be really, really powerful. And some of those bits like reorganizing it, could you get AI to say, actually, can you split these bits up? But I think that's that would be the really good bit that would allow proper scaling. OK, fab. Thank you very much for that. We'll come straight back to you after our break. We're going to have a 10 minute break now, everybody. OK, so grab coffee, chocolate, whatever you need to re-energize yourselves. And then we will reconvene with a little bit of a discussion uh, with David, Heidi and Steve before we move on to our last session. So see you in 10 minutes. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, for staying around with us this afternoon, just to uh, have a little bit more of a discussion. Uh, as you've seen, there's been lots going on in the Q&A and we have got all of those questions and we'll be in touch uh, with uh, how we're gonna move on uh, later with that. But um, there was a question earlier in the chat uh, about analytic focus from particular perspectives ontological and epistemological stances. So I wanted to start off with this as a question to each of you uh, to reflect on. I think Heidi, in your presentation, uh, Diana mentioned starting off asking ipsos facto to imagine being an anthropologist and that seemed to work quite well, I got the impression. Would, would you agree uh, with that? Yeah, I think it's um, really important to tell the generative AI who they are, what character they're playing. Um, and also when you're building that relationship. So her, because she uses it a lot as well, it's starting to learn her thinking and their relationship with each other. But she often tells it to put on a different hat. So sometimes even saying like, imagine you're the client and the client has these needs or imagine you are a sociologist or um, imagine you're a disability advocate, you know, just putting on a different hat, can it allow it to pull a different, or even imagine you're a copywriter, you know, it can be as generic or a colleague, but it gives it a hat to put on. And you find that that, that, that worked quite well. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it. Um, if you don't do that, you get a lot more generic answers back. Um, I think when people kind of start digging in or start dipping their toes, um, were they want to write the question like they would Google <laughs> and actually treating it like another human, like you're having a chat with another, you know, as if you're texting your friend or using a WhatsApp mm. chat or whatever it might be. Um, so telling it off as well, being like, no, that's terrible. That's a terrible idea. Um, try again or, you know, um, or giving it also what you like. So you have to let it know what's working and what's not, but also okay. you have to give it a perspective. So it's not just about that it can respond in that way. But what you're saying is that it's really important that you prompt it to respond in yeah. those specific yeah. ways. Yeah. And tell okay. it when you get it wrong, when they get it okay. wrong. Because okay. otherwise, um, I have had experiences where I've asked it to kind of tweak something and I've asked it to even just 
um, giving it examples of things that you do like or times that they did something right or even just something external. This is something I like. It allows it to know what it, the good looks like um, mm -hmm. and perspective looks like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, David, um, I can see you nodding your head. What do you oh, think? Oh, okay, good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that the same is true of chat GPT. And frequently you prompt it with uh, a description of who you are and what you want to hear in that vein. Uh, I would say that the one limitation on the uh, queries or prompts that I presented is that I, I didn't show the initial one where you give it some context. So the more context it has, so it would be something like these data come from focus groups with family members who are caring for someone who had dementia and were making decisions about when to seek diagnosis for that person. Okay, so that it, you know, knows that in essence, these are caregivers, not the care receivers or the dementia patients themselves. And mm -hmm. I find that, you know, just a sentence or two of context can make a lot of difference. Okay, that's interesting. So did you consider those different perspectives in your tests, your comparisons as well? Um, so, so like Heidi and Diana said, imagine you were an anthropologist. Did you do those kinds of questionings with your data as well? You no, I did not um, because I was working directly with my own data. Mm. Uh, when I chat openly with chat GPT, I, you know, give it a context of background. I'm a qualitative researcher and I'm interested in blank. Okay, so that it knows, I think uh, one Heidi or her colleague mentioned that the, you want to know the level of expertise that it's dealing with. And interestingly, when I do that, I'd rate that chat GPT comes back as sort of like an advanced graduate student in mm -hmm. terms of its ability to reply. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. S Steve, can I put the same question to you? But can you reflect on that in terms of coding? So do you think that AI coding can do this sort of thing? And if it can, how would that inform the way that we might teach qualitative methods? So I had my teaching hat on when I was thinking about what you might have to contribute well, here. To, to me, there's a thing like that, I mean, I've probably got a great phrase. It's like, you know, the first symptom, the first solution is usually a symptom of the problem. And it feels like at the moment, the this initial integration, this initial thing is like, we've got a tool here, Let's do it. Let's do it. We'll, we'll just make codes and those codes will be things. And it's like, but actually, to me, this this is almost a symptom of some of the challenges that we have a lot of coding in software that isn't coding. It It's better done with just notes. Initially, just make notes, just just make notes, your own notes about it all. But also this idea that codes always equals themes. So one of the things that, that I really notice um, other discussions about it from, from David and Heidi is how they were using it in this real dialogical way. And that feels to me like that's what I want. I want to be able to say, find the metaphors. I want to say, you know, yes, I would like you to find this and label it or find and index my data, but not this automatic as assumption that somehow coding equals the way you find themes rather than the way that you organize and index your data. I want to be able to say, right, this is my research question, or these are the things I'm looking for. Please, can you go and index the data for me based on the content against these categories? And at the moment, it's not quite there. All the promise seems to be there with the initial integrations. But I'm really hoping that some of these discussions at this event might get to a more dialogical and more open a way of working with that so that you could code for discourse patterns or narrative modes or things like that not just this you know if we end up with mansplaining themes that to me would be our worst outcome <laughs> out of an amazing tool that could do this with some of the summarizing i've applied some codes can you summarize them that seems to be quite promising but i'd really like to see a little bit more explanation of how did you do that which is always the black box Black boxing is what people seem very worried about. But I did see a great thing saying, look, the black box isn't always a bad thing. It's it's, it's only a bad thing if lives are at stake, really. Um, if it's low stakes, putting things in a black box and something comes out is great if it gets you thinking, but it's not if you think you've got the answer. 
So again, AI, a bit of a black box that throws some tools for you to go, oh, yeah, I might want to go and look at that more. That would be great. But that's what dialogue enables, was putting things into a fixed category less so. So I really hope we can shift towards that much more dialogical approach. Yeah, it's interesting. Did you want to say something back to that, David? Oh, just that I've always liked the analogy of coding is more like indexing. Mm. It's a way of telling you what's in the data, and it's up to you to figure out why the data looks that way. Mm. Yeah. To, to me, it's that one. It's like, then you've got to pick your index, because it's like, if an index is all the words in a book, it's not a very good index. It's like a one-to-one -one map of your terrain. No, you need to pick some scale. But I do see people not really thinking of it in those ways it's about organizing and I think and again my fear with some of these approaches with AI is it could reinforce some not particularly great equating codes equals themes equals analysis mm. that's that's problematic yeah actually last uh last week in part one we started to talk about um in a couple of the sessions actually about whether uh, these new tools that we're seeing now are going to change the way we do analysis more generally. So specifically, do we even need to code anymore when we can have this dialogic uh, conversation? So I wondered uh, what you all thought about that. So can I go to Heidi first? Because Heidi, at the moment, um, from what you were both saying in the presentation, um, Am I right in understanding that you're not using Ipsos Facto so directly for the analysis? So you were saying you were still doing the analysis in the way you had done previously, but you were using Ipsos Facto to check the analysis rather than do the analysis. Is is that to do with coding or is that some, something else? Uh, it's kind of multiple reasons. So I think partly, as, as Steve was saying, I think part of it is that right now it's most useful for kind of it's most useful for organizing and like, you know, kind of creating buckets or themes. And then you're taking those and you're still having to put your human kind of uh, analytical brain of, of of figuring out because I I think it's didactic and it doesn't necessarily um, nuance those in the same way. And I think that's also about training, like over time training it, it will get better at it and you'll get better at also knowing the kind of questions to ask. But also the limitations we currently have, at least with an Ipsos, which is getting dealt with on a constant, like they're constantly upgrading it in the next couple of years, will be very different, is right now it's a lot about text input. And ethnographic research isn't just about what people say, it's about what people do and what you observe and the feelings and the mood and the, everything, you know, it's the contextual experience of things. And so we use video as one of our main um, data points. And then we turn the, we use that for both analysis and um, outputs and storytelling. And I think um, I'm excited as a person that's always done documentary film and ethnographic film. I'm really excited about the idea that we'll be able to, you know, programs like Adobe Premiere will be updated to a way that you'll have a conversation with it, where you'll start saying, look for all of the things that have this, or, and it won't just about be about what people say, but anytime there might be something in the shot or anytime people's voices raise or the tonal experience, mm -hmm. you know, the moods and the, and the shifts of a space, if there's, so you can start pulling the footage in that way, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that will be for us, the next level of, video analysis that right now is so unruly to do like mm. to be able to sift through you know 70 hours of footage um yeah. and be able to get that level of detail because they'll be able to do that sifting will be incredible and um, not just the amount of footage so the multi-dimensional nature of the video is what you're getting at isn't you and and if, if these generative ai tools can help disentangle that um, you know, not only quickly, but in a way that's that that makes the process more manageable. I can see that that would be a, a massive um, impact on the on the way that you work. Yeah, yeah, and I think it would be just in general. I think currently we spend a lot of time using as a shortcut. Not not actually we don't, but a lot of qualitative researchers use um, transcripts, yeah. and transcripts take something that was alive and flatten it onto paper, right? And mm. like to be able to bring that back alive and start mm. thinking about different ways of, of emphasizing will be mm. incredible, I think. 
Can I put that question back to David then? So just yeah. very quickly, is coding well, dead? Sure. <laughs> I'm probably an extremist in that regard. And uh, I think it'd be interesting to hear from Steve about the scalability issues, because I primarily do work with small scale issues or small scale data sets. So 19 focus groups was a huge amount for me. Uh, trying to work with that by hand, uh, you know, just no fun at all. And so I uh, think from last week, I know I don't want to misquote Suzanne Frieza, but uh, she said, uh, I believe in one of her blogs, coding is obsolete. OK, that's a pretty strong statement. And I think we ought to begin to wonder about whether that is the case as we go down the road. I think the thing I've seen with people I've been conversing with is trying to find some way to do, quote, thematic analysis with generative AI. And I think that's a lost cause myself. I, I think it really is much more effective to work with the kinds of themes that AI can give you and then drill down on those instead of trying to build up from somehow doing micro level coding with AI. I just don't mm -hmm. see, or at least generative AI. I don't see how that's gonna work. So that's interesting. I think, well, I know that Steve's got much to say on this topic, so let's hear it. Um, I mean, I, 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 you know, to me, it will be absolutely 100% yes. It will have a huge, massive influence and 100% no. Uh, there will be the, the amount of, you know, the, the it's quite quite so you know basically since the invention of the tape recorder most of sociology put its feet up and decided to stop thinking about technology i think that still holds true the number of people who are you know automatic um transcription is available i see loads of students using it because they are time poor but their supervisors are still saying no you need to manually transcribe nothing else will get you in touch with the data i do it all with post-it notes i print everything out and, and so there's something there. I mean, one of the things I got so interested in scale, it's not only that quote, which 15 years on, I still think is a challenge, but it's it's that thing about my fear more broadly is that I fear that like what was an exciting, uh, really, really creative social science world at the point the tape recorder was invented, you suddenly had Harvey Sachs creating a whole thing of conversation analysis whole new areas created. Suzanne Fries did some great bits about, and, and, and Silvana about the development of technology and their influence. But it feels like instead of thinking, what can we do, how can we move? So much stuff is somehow being seeded to data scientists. And mm. the land grab of sociology to quantitative methods, while qualitative, so many qualitative people just say, well, 12 people, thematic analysis, tape recorder that i think is a challenge so there's, i think it's it's really important to engage with mixed methods to engage with the idea of working with larger data but also to really make the case that a qualitative insight is vital and yes you know this dialogic engagement with um ai could really help us with classification and so on but we really need to be looking at what it is and isn't what it can and can't do, find the gaps and really articulate them rather than going, yeah, actually send, you know, take all your numbers, send the text to chat, chat GPT, you've got a thematic analysis. Mm. Um, so so I think it's, it, it's important that we do have a transformation, but I think there will be a lot of people who will just still love their highlighters. And... There's nothing wrong with the highlighter, though, is there? Because like <laughs> we can combine our tools. But what, what you say makes me think about um, the way that we're communicating what we're doing. So amongst ourselves as researchers, which I guess, you know, what we're doing here today and last week is, is part of that process. But there was also some questions in the chat about communicating the findings of research um, uh, more broadly. So Heidi's spoken uh, earlier about... Um, clients uh, of Ipsos being really excited about these uh, tools and you're clearly communicating to them in that way. Uh, David, you're, you've got a couple of articles uh, on your recent work with ChatGPT coming out. Uh, but, you know, we also think uh, about, um, you know, journal articles and how their uh, journals and publications and how they're responding uh, to these sorts of things. 
so I need to wrap this uh, session up, uh, but just a couple of um, questions uh, or reflections there. David, you you haven't had much problem with with publishing your your qualitative research about chat GPT. Is that right? I haven't, but I'm doing mostly uh, literally methodological research on studying the method. Mm. And I don't know what's going to happen when people submit things and say, you know, under analysis or something like that, that we use chat GPT. And maybe if they even say they use query based analysis, cite Morgan 2024 or something. How's that going to mm. go up with the reviewers and the editors is a very open question. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, much to consider, much to think about. Uh, as per usual, uh, we could carry on the four of us talking for many more hours, no doubt. Uh, but we've still got uh, another very interesting session coming up uh, this afternoon. So I'm going to thank the three of you again very much. You can see all the claps coming through, all the digital claps coming through. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure this uh, conversation will continue uh, along the way, uh, but I'm going to share again so that I can transition to uh, our final uh, session, uh, which is a panel discussion, which is chaired uh, by Isabella Piera, who is a specialist in qualitative research methods and research ethics with extensive experience in designing and conducting projects of various types. She is the head of qualitative methodology at Ipsos UK. In fact, she was a founding member of their qualitative social research methods team. She leads qualitative and mixed methods studies for government departments, think tanks and charities, and has run some of uh, Ipsos's largest, most complex and sensitive qualitative studies over the years. Isabella has also recently served as a trustee of the Social Research Association. Her interests are really wide ranging uh, and she has specialist knowledge and experience of diversity and inclusion issues in several sectors, as well as research ethics and methodological knowledge, which she uses in researching vulnerable audiences, housing, welfare, children and families, access to justice and migration, and integration. We couldn't think of a better person to chair this final uh, panel dis uh, discussion of our symposium. So thank you very much, Isabella, uh, for doing so. I will hand over to you now uh, and let you introduce and start the discussion amongst our panel members. Oh, yeah, Sylvie, Donna, and Prokopis, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, well, um, my head's slightly reeling from from that session. Um, I know that um, some of you have worked with me before in different ways, and uh, I'm very attached to my highlighters and post-it notes. So that is, um, it's, it's quite quite a lot to take in there. Um, but um, before we before we um, get into a conversation, of course, it's important for me to introduce introduce all of our panels, um, our panel members here today. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing this panel. Um, it's an opportunity for us to reflect on what we've heard in these excellent sessions. Um, as you know, the SRA supports social researchers across all different sectors. So this afternoon, we have experts from, um, from the academic world, um, from the agency world, and also from government research. Um, we have um, Dr. Prokopis Christou, who's an assistant professor um, at the Cypress University of Technology. Um, and we have um, Donna Phillips, Senior Director in Population Studies at Berrien, formerly Cantel Public, and Sylvia Hobden, who's Head of Public Attitudes at the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, um, which is part of the Department of Science, Innovation and Technology. Um, and um, uh, I think, as I understand it, yeah, all um, everyone's um, profiles have been posted up. If you'd like a bit more detail about um, about all our panelists, um, I thought it might be wiser to do that rather than go into lots of detail at the moment because there is really so much to talk about. Um, one of the first things I wanted to start with, as somebody who works on the research agency side, is that um, we've had lots of questions come up um, in the discussions today about data protection. And we know that it's one of the biggest barriers to um, putting 
um, AI into practice for social research, um, considerations of where the data um, used within AI tools is stored, um, and broader issues of data protection. So I wondered if we could start there. Um, how should we think about this problem? What kinds of issues does it bring up? Um, Donna, I wonder if I could start with your comments on that and your thoughts. Yeah, sure. I think um, I, I saw all the, all the Q&A in the chat and the first thing that was asked about the state of security, which is not a surprise at all. Um, we have, similar to ipso facto, we, um, we have a, a partner, we partner with Faculty AI, um, an AI uh, organisation who've worked with us to develop our own um tool for call analysis um smart matrix analyzer and and that was kind of the first point that that we wanted to be really um sure about was the data security so i think the developments now um and i i take the point of of previous speakers about having access to the cloud but we're able to host our tool within our own secure environment so um, I think the developments, the way that large language models um, open AI using ChatGPT, obviously other large language models are available, um, but you can deploy if you're able to, if you have access to the cloud, um, you can deploy now in your own secure environments and kind of build those tools within the cloud. Um, but outside of that, I think, like you say, anonymization is absolutely key, and we would look um, we would look at that anyway as researchers. Um, and just to add that I'm not a qualitative researcher, so my background is as a statistician and quantitative researcher. So I found this really fascinating. Um, but it, it's very much the same. Just really think about anonymization, keeping data secure, um, and it it can be used securely. But I think the first it's the way you design the tool and the way you use about it that data security should be the absolute first thing that you think about. Um, Sylvie, you're nodding. Can I bring you in? Yeah, so building on what Donna has said, the research that we've done within CDEI demonstrates that this is a really sensitive issue with the public. So while people increasingly recognise the benefits of using data across a variety of different use cases, the security of data remains a really pressing concern and large proportions of the public say that the risk of their data being hacked or stolen is their greatest concern about data use. So it's really important that we ensure that we don't undermine public trust um, and set things back. Um, we need to get this right. Um, so bearing in that in mind, I think there's two ways of looking at data storage in particular. So firstly, there is an increasing openness in government to taking a proportionate approach when it comes to data storage. Um, the government recognises that unjustified barriers to data sharing across borders in particular could create missed opportunities. Um, and the, data, the national data strategy is, is looking at ways to overcome these barriers while still ensuring that there's really high data um, protection standards in place, but clearly it's really complex um, and the government's working on that at the moment. But in the meantime, I think where data is less sensitive, there is perhaps a little bit more flexibility about where data is stored within limits, of course. So it's worth having those conversations with the teams, teams you're working with in the public sector. I think the other side of the coin is like, as um, Donna was touching on, um, there are ways of kind of achieving um, De secure data storage within the UK or the EA within the bespoke models that are often developed in house and also the big cloud computing providers do recognize the continuing need for data localization, particularly in the public sector and are relatively recently starting to enable this through their services. Um, so in some cases, perhaps there are options for data storage now that there weren't a couple of years ago. So that's something for kind of companies who are developing AI tools to respond to, given that there is that continuing need. But inevitably, I think it's the case of meeting in the middle in the short term. Um, but as I said, the trajectory is moving towards flexibility in terms of where data is stored. That's so interesting to hear, Sylvie, because um, it's good to know that um, David Morgan talked about funding bodies need to be open minded as well. So it's good to know that that from from where we sit, the client side perspective is is moving as fast as as um as the as the technology is as well that's that's really useful to know and very interesting um i wondered um 
um, Prokopis, if I could bring you in as well, do you, do you have a perspective on data privacy um, and where data is stored in the context of using AI? Well, um, besides the things that Donna and Sylvie stressed, which are very important, there's also from an academic perspective, there's also the element of how the data are extracted by researchers and academics uh, um, and uh, how they are uh, analyzed and what information are disclosed. And um, this is very important um, for, for the researcher's perspective to be able to um, be extremely careful how uh, of what AI systems they use to extract and analyze the information and what information they disclose in the research they put and the output that they put. Um, it's very it's very important to uh, to consider to consider the uh, the use of um, uh, when we analyze uh, the information whether that's um, text information or whether that's videos in, the, um, in terms of ethnographic studies. Uh, to be extremely careful of what, what kind of information we disclose as researchers. And that's what, something that I keep on stressing to my students as well as researchers, whether our PhD, PhD students, of how they um, use that information and what information they disclose about uh, and how they extract information. Uh, they should be extremely cautious and transparent as well. Okay. Um, when the in the session, the first session, um, which um, I'm sure most of you will have seen some of at least, um, the developers also talked about um the option for whether um whether the material that's put into these models can be used as training data or not as well. So perhaps that's perhaps that's a factor as well. Negotiating with them, um, negotiating with suppliers to consider whether whether material would be used as training data. Um, Sylvia, you're nodding. I don't know if this is something that you're familiar with or. Um, I think I think um, as kind of was touched on earlier, mm. when where that data is used for the purposes of training, it's very abstracted and mm. and kind of it's like a guest style to the data that that becomes but is built into the parameters of the model but that's not necessarily to say that that's okay um i think there are now kind of well-trod avenues to ensure that data doesn't get put into that training data set so i think it's to explore on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the tool that's being used yeah i mean it seems the message here is that actually there are a lot of questions that we could be asking and working with working with our research partners when we're thinking about using ai it's not it's not a sort of straightforward yes or no. Um, I don't know if there's anything more that people want to talk about um, on the side of data privacy. It's such a big issue, such an important issue. Any comments? Okay, well, I can, I can move on to, um, just wondering if there are any questions. Um, I'll just move on to talking about um, public perceptions and expectations. So, Sylvie, you touched on this already. Um, I wondered if there are any additional considerations we need to give to public perceptions and expectations when we're when we're using AI for qualitative data analysis. Consent is a really big issue as well. That came up a number of times today um, and in the questions too. Um, is there something you might be able to say about that? Yes, lots. Um, so the really good thing is, as I touched upon, our research shows that the public is generally quite open to the use of AI across a wide range of different uses. People increasingly recognise the benefits of using it and they've often seen that there's like a positive impact of AI in their own lives or their own work. However, the public also recognise that there are risks, of course, and because of these risks, there are several criteria that they want to see met where AI is being used. So these criteria apply across a range of AI applications in the public sector, but they've also got implications for how we should think about using AI in qualitative analysis as researchers. So first, our research shows that the public really want the fact that AI is being used to be very transparently communicated so that they can make informed choices about how they engage with it. So as researchers, we should be really explicit about how AI is being used in the research process. And that allows participants to make an informed decision about whether or not they then want to take part in the research. And in some cases, the use of AI might have nuanced impacts on participants' decisions. So 
our research um, shows that there are concerns among the public about the loss of the human touch that come up quite frequently. And we know that some participants really value human interaction in the research process, and this might extend to the analysis of the data itself. So participants might choose not to take part or not to share certain types of information if they know their data won't be analysed by a human. I don't know if that, I, haven't, I don't have any evidence for that, but it seems likely that for some people that may be an issue. Um, and I think we also need to consider transparency from a safety perspective. So if participants assume that a human is going to review their response, they might use research as a channel to request help or to disclose harm. Obviously, if a human is conducting the interview, then those disclosures would be identified at the time. But if the research was taking place, for example, in an online community and analysed using AI, there's a chance that any disclosures could be missed. So we should make it really clear where data isn't going to be reviewed by a human. And if the research is on a sensitive topic, ensure that participants have alternative channels where they can seek any support that they might need. Um, then the second thing that we learned from our research is that there needs to be a really clear public benefit for the use of AI. And that should ideally feel quite tangible to individuals. So it's important that as researchers, we can clearly identify why we're using AI in a way that demonstrates how, ben how it benefits the individuals who are taking part in the research. So it's possibly not enough just to say that in it, the analysis will be more efficient, which I know some people talked a lot about quite a lot, but we also need to explain why it being more efficient will benefit individuals. For example, does the use of AI mean that we're able to speak to a broader, more inclusive group of people or analyze much larger quantities of data? Or does it ensure that our analysis is completed in time to have a really meaningful impact on policy development, which is often kind of uh, being implemented at pace? So these are like more tangible impacts that are going to feel more credible to members of the public. And then finally, we see consistently that people want AI to be used in a way that augments rather than replaces human capability. Um, the public really feel most comfortable with the use of AI where there is still a human in the loop. So as researchers, again, we should use AI in a way that really complements rather than replaces the researcher skill set. And I'm sure we'll come onto this in a lot more detail, but it's really important that we highlight that to participants. Um, so those are the key considerations, although there are loads of others. Um, I think it's notable that these criteria really align quite closely with the government's data ethics framework and also the SRA research ethics guidance, which demonstrates that like, although the use of AI does prompt specific concerns from the public, lots of existing best practice is still really applicable to the use of AI in research. So we shouldn't forget all the things that we already know. Okay. Do you think, um, this is a question to all the panellists really, um, I mean you, you, you touched there on ethics and ethics frameworks and ethics guidance as well, um, do you think the, you know, what we have at the moment is fit for purpose, is there, is there more that we need extra support on, um, on when it comes to ethics and, and AI um, for social researchers and for qualitative social researchers? Donna? Um, I would say yes, but I think researchers are getting up to speed as well, alongside everyone else. There was um, research published by Ofcom this week in their Online Nations report, and they, they had a poll on who's using generative AI, which um, was really interesting. Oh, it's not a surprise at all that younger people are using it more, um, a, a much higher percentage of younger people, um, and that really decreases as as um, as the age groups go up um, and I think it just shows and there was quite a substantial percentage of people who didn't actually know what it is and I think that is is a concern um, for researchers so understanding exactly what it is so what Sylvia was saying is really about consent is it really informed consent and how do we we need to understand how it's working ourselves so um, that, that comment about black box, which we know that particularly government does not like, they don't, don't like black box methods, they like to know exactly you know, uh, how we're researching, how we're analysing data, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. Um, and I think just being really clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And as Sylvie said, just having that guidance to be able to explain it to our participants, research participants, but yes, I'm sure we're going to just be behind. I think everyone's behind the, the speed of development in AI, and we've just got to try and, and catch up. And I think kind of collaborating with people who, who do know about this more than we do, I think really helps. So um, kind of bringing in 
the experts in AI, um, working with the CDEI um, and just kind of working together and de really developing that guidance and for it to be agile as well. It, we're, it's moving forward so quickly um, that we just need to try and keep up with it. Yeah, and, and keep on top of how we communicate with the public about it as well, um, because that's absolutely central to what we do as social researchers. Yeah, really interesting. Um, um, Prokopis, can I bring you in? I, don't, I wondered if you had a view on consent. Oh, can't hear you. Sorry, yeah, Sorry. I don't know if you can hear me now, I guess. Um, well, there's a, there's a theory called the technolo technology acceptance model which uh, basically posits that the acceptance of new technology uh, can be attributed to how easy it is for us to use it and how useful it is for our, us to use it. And the more easy it is and useful it is for us, the more that we use it. And that also applies for AI. If people, uh, if the public is aware of um, the benefits on uh, and the personal gain they will um, obtain or at least the societal, excuse me, value that they will obtain by uh, using AI in any form, uh, they will be more prompt to use it. Um, and therefore, organizations need to be aware of the fact that they need to put out there the benefits that um, if there are by uh, using um, uh, AI to make people uh, use it more or to give the consent more easily, let's say, to, to for the uh, data to use. And the same applies for the researchers. The more they feel that they uh, they will benefit from it, the more they use it. And that's why the AI is making such a big impact nowadays, because the researchers are acknowledging all that um, benefits that they can acquire uh, through the use of AI technology. Okay, so <clears throat> there's again there's the theme throughout the the two sessions um there's there's a lot to do but um but uh um, and because there is so much change afoot but um yeah um we can and we need to sort of reflect that in so many different dimensions so yeah thank you um i wondered if it might be worth talking about inclusivity and diversity in the people involved in development AI. Um, that's a real um, a big concern. Um, and um, there's been quite a bit of discussion about bias today, um, not just about how, um, how um, models can be, um, AI based models can be biased, but also how potentially um, AI can help us overcome bias as well. And the interesting sort of perspectives there from Heidi. Um, <clears throat> and I, want, I wondered if, um, if the panel might be able to comment on that. Um, what do these issues around inclusivity, diversity, and the potential for bias mean um, for social researchers? So um, um, I'm not sure who, who'd be keen to start on that. Maybe, maybe Donna, if you have a view. Yeah, sure. Um... I thought Heidi's point was really interesting about how it can be used to help overcome bias because you normally hear arguments just the other way. Um, I think so for the development of our tool with, with faculty, it was very much the core researchers at Varian working with faculty data scientists and data engineers developing the tool um, together. Um, so, and we were very lucky in that way. That's not always an option, I know that. Uh, but it meant that it was developed specifically for that purpose and with the researchers involved. So already you've got more of a diverse um, kind of background and experience. Um, the researchers could think about, obviously they are experts in, in research, but also think about their participants and who they who they might speak to. So kind of the range of, of people in the population so they may be hard to reach groups, how might that impact them? Um, so they bring that breadth of, of experience. Um, and then obviously the more technical people um, bringing their expertise together. And it, it worked really well that way. I think it is, it is a, a problem in terms of development of AI just more broadly because it's the expertise is very in specific organizations and maybe they're from you know it's been said and books have been written on this a lot of books have been written on this that you know that it's very kind of developed by my men um more likely to be white 
Um, but I think that it, it, you don't necessarily have to, although it's great to have more women and a diverse group of people coding and developing software and models, um, I think it's just getting more people involved in the whole process itself. So you don't have to be the person coding or learning lots of code. You can be the person that they've reached out to that's part of the wider kind of group um, in developing that. And I think in that way, considering different types of people, um, you will get overcome hopefully some of the bias that doesn't get over the bias in data, which we know um, <laughs> is out there, is on the internet, um, and particularly if you use social media. You mentioned as well, um, almost um, undertaking some kind of impact assessment as well, and like trying to think about who is going to be affected. Um, I've been doing quite a, re a bit of reading around the sort of ethical cons considerations and how you might overcome them. And I wonder if a more sy a systematic approach to looking at what the impact of using AI tools could be could be helpful in this way. Yeah, I, I think that's that's a really good point. I think an impact assessment is is a really good approach to take. Um, we see it with with government uh, government policy. Um, government departments do this for government policy and um, they carry out impact assessments. So yeah, it could be part of um, kind of that ethics framework um, if you follow the government um, guidance that Sylvie mentioned, um, carrying out a, um, a checklist and making sure like you are looking into the impact of using these tools um, and how it might impact certain groups. And we know that there are people who are digitally excluded and they, they're feeling more and more excluded as um, this kind of technology develops. And I think as re researchers, it's it's really important to make sure that we are including as many people as we can. I wondered if others might like to comment on this idea of inclusivity, bias related issues. Sylvie. Yeah, so I think it's really important that um, researchers understand uh, a bit about um, the issues of bias when we're using AI so that we can look at any tools that we're using through a critical lens. And as we've been doing during this symposium, we can ask developers how diverse and representative the training data was, how rigorously the tools have been evaluated and any steps they've taken to mitigate bias. And based on that, then we can make more informed decisions about whether to use any given AI tool uh, for any given research context. And it might be the case that where we're research, conducting research on sensitive topics or among vulnerable groups, it might not be appropriate to use AI if the risk of bias feels unacceptable. Um, but then I also think like on the other end, if we do use AI, it, there's potentially should be more emphasis on making proactive efforts to pressure test the outcomes. So triangulating the outcomes of our analysis between different data sources where they're available to see how our findings compare and also involving really diverse participants or affected communities or experts in reviewing the outputs in order to help identify any outliers or anom anomalies that might have crept in as a result of using AI. Um, so I think it's like, as in all research, we're aware of how bias can creep in from the kind of start to the end of the research process. Um, and again, I think when we're using AI, we need to think about it as an end-to-end -end process to like mitigate bias, but take it obviously very seriously. Start thinking about sort of rigorous approaches that we can take to overcome those biases. Yeah, those are some really interesting um, suggestions. Um, Prakofis, I wonder, do you have a view as well on bias? Well, uh, basically adding on what Donna and Celie have covered, I'll, I'll, I would have uh, also added the fact that um, a lot of these AI systems um, are not user-friendly for the visually impaired. Um, um, so it's also, uh, you should consider those people that are, um, that um, may not have like the vision or whatever to use those AI tools. So the designers need to have a more human-centric design um, focus when they're designing and developing these systems. That makes sense, yeah, thank you. Um, I wondered, um, the big discussion this afternoon has been um, around qualitative research analysis practice. So, um, Donna, I know that you're not a qualitative researcher. I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, 
bully you into into commenting too much on all the technicalities of um of what it is like doing particularly working um with data using AI. Um but it raises a lot of questions about how we act as researchers, um the a impacts of AI on on um on our role as critical thinkers um and agents within the sort of research process. Um Prokofis, I wondered what you thought about that. I know that's something that you've written a great deal about. Well, basically, there are a lot of benefits of using AI, and I can't describe them. Um, we all know about them. Uh, but there's, a, again, one theory. that's they, they, they called resource dependence theory, which states basically that uh, organizations, entities, people are significantly impacted by their dependence, and I'm stressing that word, dependence, on crucial resources within that environment, uh, such as the technological environment. And nowadays, uh, we have with the AI um, being bombarded with all those AI tools that be to use, and why not use them, whether for uh, analysis purposes or for whatever reasons. Um, also, ask qualitative researchers. However, um, I'm, I'm quoting uh, the previous uh, uh, speaker, David Morgan, about the uh, he he stated in his presentation about. Uh, using AI tools requires human judgment. And, and I'm stressing that also. I'm, I'm coding and em emphasizing that. In terms of um, this optimization of procedures uh, through the use of AI may shift or marginalize any critical thinking or in, in um, maybe interpretive um, qualities of the researcher um, and and replace them with the uh, with the press of a button. And also, uh, from the perspective of academics, um, I'm pretty sure that, and we have already started receiving um, articles to review um, that have used um, AI systems, not just ChatGPT, but in general AI tools. And it's actually impressive the output that is being presented, and it looks very graphical and very visual and all that. And it surprises me also as a reader. However, um, most of the cases, they, they like of that, um, let's say, um, critical thinking and evaluative skills that are necessary and interpretive skills that are necessary for the quality of researchers to put out there when writing the papers, um, which should, should be demonstrated. Um, basically, to sum things up, um, AI is there to be used, and why not? Because of all those benefits. However, there are risks involved, and one of those is the marginalization of us as humans, the, re the researchers. And um, uh, there should there should be a balance of treatment, whether that's in the form of analysis or critical thinking of which tools to use to start with. Because it's not just the analysis; it's also um, for for instance, when we when we start a research as researchers, we use a theoretical context, theoretical a theory to examine our problem. And and what what a perfect solution is to to ask for Chat GTP to suggest a theoretical prism um, for us to use. However, is that the correct one? Is is it appropriate to examine that research phenomenon? Are we adding to the knowledge, uh, to the existing knowledge by using that theory? It's are things that um, researchers will be called to to ask in the in the future, and um, we should not also ask researchers and reviewers of journals or whatever not um, uh, fall into the pitfall of of, of not um, welcoming papers that have not used AI. Because it will be, it will be in the future. It will be so a must to use AI. But um, I, I, I don't think that it will be. It is uh, absolutely necessary to do that uh, and showcase that we've done that. Uh, besides, there are still a lot of risks involved in using AI, which I'm pretty sure they'll be min minimized in the future. Such as the fact that, uh, and I think um, we stressed that. I think it was Steve Wright that stressed that in his presentation that. Um, uh, performance uh, that, that may uh, 
Uh, let me show you that the AI may say that they've done a thematic analysis, but I, I, at the end of the day, uh, what's been done is a cluster analysis, which is completely different uh, and more used uh, with uh, with uh, data and numbers rather than uh, rather than um, than um, than what, what the principles of thematic analysis are. So I don't know if you've quite confused everyone. <laughs> 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 I think, I mean, certainly what um, was talked about in the last panel session was um, a sense that the role of the qualitative researcher is transforming. AI is going to change how we do things. Um, and, you know, uh, the, this, this idea of like, does it mean the death of coding? Does it mean the transformation of coding? Does it mean we think about coding differently in the process? Um, or we're clearer about coding and, and what it and, and what we're doing when we're doing that. Um, I mean, I found all of that pretty fascinating, and I think that resonates with with what you're saying, um, Prokopis, that um, you can't take the human out of this scenario. <laughs> that would be um, that would be deeply unfortunate. Um, but we we it looks it looks very clear that we're going to have to change the way that we do things. Um, Sitting where you sit in the academic world and, and speaking to um, um, the question that was raised about um, uh, journals and reviewing and the credibility of work that draws on AI, what, what, what do you think that means for people, um, for qualitative researchers who are going to be using AI in their analysis? Um, do you think that, um, that um, review boards are going to have to change the way they think about things? what could influence that well sorry was that was that question directed to me I, <laughs> yes it, it, it sort of was really unless um, um Sylvia yeah. and donna want to come in um well um journals a, a lot of journals have already um requ are requesting authors to uh, specify whether and the extent to which they have used ai tools such as gtp for uh, for um, for writing their articles or for analyzing their data, um, I, um, I'm 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 pretty sure, and I wrote an article about that. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure whether uh, people, researchers, will be uh, willing to uh, disclose the extent that they uh, to which they used AI, such as AI tools. Now, for the analysis for analysis purposes, it's it's much easier to to state that I've used this and this system uses a specific algorithm and all that. But um, putting out there that uh, they used AI to write a literature review or a conceptual paper or just a theoretical discussion of the paper, I think um, uh, researchers will be hesitant to to disclose that to disclose that information because it. Um, it will show that they haven't done much of their work of their own. Mm. Um, so there is a... Mm. Attention. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Do you think, um, to Donna and Sylvie, um, do you think that has implications for work in the government side and for the kinds of, um, the kinds of people who fund, fund research in government charities? Um, so many of the other commissioners of social research. Um, what what could researchers be doing to be transparent about the way they're using AI, and how should we be framing that? Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think everything that we've heard this afternoon. Um, I mean, ours, our uh, our tool um, actually brings the researchers closer to the data. What it does is summarise against topics that the, the um, core researchers uh, prompt. And it can also generate ideas because it's a predictive, it's a predictive model basically. So it can generate ideas. It's really good at generating ideas, which I think is, is where a lot of people are, are kind of using it, a lot of researchers are using it. Um, but I think, yeah, it is important about to, to be very, clear with clients to, to listen to concerns. Um, the clients that we've spoken to are really interested in it. Um, like, the, like I said, the first thing they ask about is data security, which is not a surprise. 
the second thing is about hallucinations and ethics. So um, our tool, uh, it generates, it pulls uh, quotes from the transcript, from the interview transcript, and the researcher can click on that and check that it was real. Um, so we've got a QA system built into our tool. So I think that's that's worth thinking about just to allay client concerns. Um, and I think as well, kind of picking up from your previous question, how the quo researcher role is changing, I think this is broader as well across other types of research, is, is the prompt engineering. So how we talk to the tools and how we use them. I think that's really important and showing clients that we know how we're using the tools and, and how they should use the tools. Um, so just really showing them that we are, we do know what we're doing. It does have a human oversight, which is really important. Um, we are in fact freeing up, and I know there's a, there's a conversation about uh, efficiency and scale. Um, we like to try and do both. Um, we are making things more efficient to to lead the interpretation to give more time for interpretation to the expert core researchers so it's saving them time on the kind of back-end processing um, as we would see it to to give them more time to add value and to bring their skills um, so i don't think it's gonna i can't see that it's going to completely replace anytime soon um, but i think you're right that that clients do need to be very very much aware and when you when you receive when you see tenders as well, you can see what clients are asking for and just tailoring it to that. Um, and like Sylvie said, when it might not be appropriate to use at all, so when we might just say no, we're not going to do that. Um, we know the risk is is too high. The clients will not respond to it, so we won't use it. Yeah, um, Sylvie, I wondered if you had a view as well. Yeah, I'm probably just mirroring things that Apropokis and uh, Donna have already said. But mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, again, it's really important that we're able to articulate what the tangible benefits to clients or participants are of using AI, whether that's scale versus speed, it may, whether it makes research more inclusive, whether we're able to have uh, impact in more real time, which can be really powerful, just like really being able to articulate what those benefits are. Um, and while AI isn't necessarily objective, it can be really helpful to augment researchers by generating ideas. It can act as devil's advocates, uh, take a new perspective, especially where we can prompt it to do that if we're using an, an, a large language model. Um, and kind of ultimately it can free up more time for researchers to focus on the deeper phases of analysis where we can add really real value through our expertise and our ability to contextualize the information yeah. um, and draw those kind of more nuanced links. And that's really borne out in the um, a discussion we just saw from Heidi actually and where where she talked really explicitly about that which is which is really interesting and the, the big message I'm taking from from all of you there is about transparency about really um I know um, David Morgan talked about AI as a collaborator and trying to find the right word for that but um if we can talk very clearly about what we're doing when we're collaborating with AI and sort of explaining that all the way through the process we may help allay some of those concerns, fears, questions from both client side and, and from the public's point of view as well. But I guess one of the underpinning problems that we've had that you alluded to, I think, Sylvie, earlier is that the public in particular don't really know very much about what AI is. And, you know, I must admit, <laughs> I would say that probably, like, you know, I'm learning, we're all learning, etc. How How do we overcome those issues, do you think? It's challenging. So awareness of AI is increasing, um, like on a top line level, but whether understanding is increasing as well is more, more questionable and people might have varied understandings of what AI is. Um, and that's why I think that's why it's important to be able to understand like the so what of using it, mm -hmm. um, because that in the end is the impact that it's going to have on participants and clients. So I think really spend some time thinking about that and drilling down into it, what it means for those individuals and communicate that. Yeah, um, we've got about sort of um, five, ten minutes left. And I just wondered, um, the one of the purposes of this panel was to talk about the opportunities and the challenges of AI in the future. And 
um, what I perhaps ought to have done at the start of this session, but um, didn't give you the chance to do, is reflect on anything that struck you as a big opportunity or a big challenge, or anything that you felt was interesting or that you'd learned in the course of these um, these symposia. Um, was there anything that anyone wanted to sort of share about that that you think is important um, to reflect on, or that you have found interesting, or have learned in the course of the the discussions that we've heard. Then, yeah, Sylvie. I think the conversation earlier um, with Heidi, where she was talking about how AI, if we get move away from text analysis to kind of um, audio analysis or video analysis, it's really exciting that it could uh, really enrich the research um, to kind of including a much broader range of kind of cues that we maybe don't focus on so much because of the focus that we have on kind of transcripts at the moment. So I think that's really exciting and things moving so quickly that that will come pretty quickly, it feels like at the moment. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think as well, building on to that is, is the scale point. So um, as a, a kind of analyst, data scientist, um, I like big data. Um, most of data in the world is is text um mm -hmm. and the fact that we'll be able to analyze more more textual data um carry out more interviews and be able to analyze kind of do the the grunt work on that first and then and then um free up researchers to really add their expertise to it so i think we'll be able to do more um and and more mixed methods possibly easier as well using those tools yeah absolutely um i was hoping someone would mention scale <laughs> i'm working on something a study that is around 500 interviews at the moment and uh yeah it, you know, obviously those things you know studies like that present certain kinds of challenges so it's really interesting and absolutely regarding mixed methods so exciting um completely agree um prokopis yeah, we heard a lot, a, a lot lots of information, uh, valuable information uh, shared by the presenters in the symposium. And I'm, I'm seizing this opportunity, Isabella and the rest, to, um, to call, uh, and I'm sending it now as a message also, uh, for my new book uh, titled as um, Artificial Intelligence in Social Research. If anyone wants to share their uh, opinions, views, uh, practical implications, theoretical implications of whatever use of AI, um as a chapter in my new book please uh, feel free to uh, drop me an email uh i've written my email down there um there's, there's also, also details on research gate that i shared about the book and it's uh, um uh its aim and uh, objectives and all that so if you feel that you want to contribute it uh, a chapter uh please feel free to do that Thank you for the opportunity, Isabella. That's okay. I think it's Christina you need to thank. Um, so yeah, okay. um, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think those are great reflections on the opportunities, and um, it 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 is it is really exciting. Even you know, and it's great to know that you know I I won't have to put away my highlighters and my post-it notes. They're still going to be important in the process. Um, but um. You know, we we have reflected a little bit on the challenges. Um, they are they're big, they're complex, they're definitely tricky. Um, you know, given the the size of the opportunity and 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 what this might mean for you know, if it really is as as, as David Morgan suggested, um, potentially a paradigm shift in how we do qualitative research. What do you think this means for? for us as social researchers um, and also the profession, what do you think social researchers are going to need, qualitative social researchers, what do you think we're going to need to use AI responsibly, to use AI credibly? Thoughts welcome. <laughs> I, th I think those, those prompts, engineering skills, so learning how to if particularly obviously with large language models. Um, so the way Heidi and team use it, it's us really developing that and, and testing that and just making sure um, 
that you're using it correctly and having the guidance. So we've, we've got very clear guidance, but then we're doing a lot, a lot of testing, um, mm -hmm. of research as well. And I think that's really important. So making sure you can use the tool and, and it is being used appropriately. Um, I think that's, that's a really important point. Um, I think, yeah, potentially it is a paradigm shift and also a lot of people will need a lot of reassurance because there's a lot of scare stories as well. So people are hearing about AI, but it's not always the, the very positive, the positive, it's um, a lot of negative and, and worries and a lot of fears. So I think um, just reassuring that the skills, the expertise is definitely still needed, um, but how that can develop with the kind of the progression of AI. And that's that's important. Yeah, um, Prokopis, I could ask you your views. Well, mir mirroring on what Donna, Donna just just said, um, we definitely need uh, technical and practical support as researchers um, because there's so many AI tools and the way they evolve is, is, is a very fast pace. And what we talk today will be um be relevant probably in, in in a couple of years so um, it's it's very um in terms of practical and implications it's very important to be equipped with uh, technical support um uh, to be able to use those effectively in terms of analysis i mean you know um and also as uh, as qualitative researchers use always our critical thinking uh, in terms of what AI tools to use, how to use it, implement it, how to be transparent, and uh, um, and what information to divulge, um, and uh, that will actually make an impact at a practical and, and theoretical level if we are academics of research. Thank you, and, and Sophie, I wonder if you have some thoughts too. Um, again, probably just mirroring what's been said, but I think it is important that researchers have a good understanding of the strengths and limitations of the tools that they're using. Because although there's loads out there, you know, people inevitably will gravitate towards using a handful. So really getting to know those tools, working with the developers to get to know them and understand what the strengths and limitations are. Um, obviously, those will change over time. So it's going to be a really iterative, constant pr pr uh, process. Um, and that's one of the challenges, I think. But then like around those tools, developing norms around what that AI can do, what that tool can do, and where it really can't replace the role of the researcher and, and kind of having yeah, norms uh, and, and best practice in that space. Um, it's a challenging time because everything's changing so quickly. Um, and But equally, I think these things will become more accepted both by clients and by participants over time. So. Uh, there's lots of opportunities that are opening up as well. Um, and I also wonder in terms of the points that you all made earlier about transparency, whether best practice around transparency could be useful to, um, and maybe best practice around um, impact assessment and maybe some kind of approach, consistent approach to that could be, could be helpful. Um, but I don't know, those are just a couple of things that I took away from, um, uh, you know, a huge amount of useful and um, very um, thought-provoking information over the, the last couple of sessions. So um, I think it probably just remains, we've just got a minute left really. So I, it, I really, I think I only have time to say thank you to all of you um, for, your, um, for your brilliant um, comments, advice and ideas in this session. It's been hugely helpful having you here to reflect on what we've all learned over the last couple of uh, couple of sessions. So I think I now um, will have, I now pass over to Christina to um, to wrap up the session. But I'd just like to say thank you to to Donna, Sylvie, and Prokopis for your contributions. So thank you. Thank you, all of you. I'd like to echo uh, Isabella's uh, thanks uh, to uh, our three panellists and also to you, Isabella. Uh, great job. Well done. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like just to wrap up in the last couple of moments to thank everybody, in fact. Uh, there's been lots uh, of very interesting uh, discussions uh, throughout these last uh, two Friday afternoons, uh, and there are many reflections and questions that we haven't had uh, time uh, to get to. 
Um, but we are collating them all and we will be providing various uh, further forums to continue uh, this conversation. Uh, if you have any ideas about what that might look like, do use uh, these last couple of moments uh, whilst I uh, give my thanks um, uh, in the chat uh, or the Q&A to let us know if you've got any uh, creative ideas about how we might uh, facilitate the continuing conversation. But for now, I want to thank everyone involved uh, in organising, presenting and contributing to this symposium. Uh, we're posting in the chat uh, right now the feedback form for today's session. Uh, and we really do want to hear from you about what you thought uh, and how you, uh, like I said earlier, would like us to facilitate continuing this uh, really important uh, discussion. Okay, you can also head on over to our websites. So the Social uh, Research uh, Association uh, run a whole load of uh, research trainings, webinars and other events, and they're holding an annual conference in June next year. Submissions for that are open right now. It's always a great day, that one, one of my personal favorite conferences. Uh, and that's being held in person in London in June. Uh, and then, of course, myself and Sarah Bullock uh, at the Cactus Networking Project also run training courses. Our website's not quite as colourful as the SRA uh, one, unfortunately, uh, but there's lots of resources there um, that you can um, uh, tap into. But for now, uh, that's the end uh, of today's uh, session. Thank you all again. Have a great uh, weekend and research well and always with eth ethics in mind. Thank you very much.